you know, those of us who were able to get up in the rain and, uh, and make our way, uh, I'm sure others will trickle in, but I don't think that's what this sort of gets going. And uh, we had no idea whether we would have a, a group of 20 or 30 or whether we'd have 100. So the, ignore the back of the room as best you can. And, uh, and uh, a few housekeeping things. First, uh, uh, my gratitude to, to, uh, to organize this uh, program from the convention. A lovely organization that does good, good stuff and put this together. Uh, they asked me to moderate, and I'll introduce myself in a moment. Uh, but a couple of housekeeping uh, items that are important. First, uh, we have validations for parking here at Cedars that reduce the uh, uh, $10 to $5 and they're available back here. Uh, there are restrooms right outside the, uh, the door across the hall, down that way about uh, 100 feet. And in uh, a program like this, it, uh, it's unusual, but I, I want everybody to feel free to get up and leave whenever you want. You know, there's no formality to it at all. Uh, uh, my name is Ed Feldman, for those who I'm not familiar with. And uh, uh, I uh, teach here on the faculty, and I have a practice in inflammatory bowel disease. And my particular interest is in the, the subject of the biopsychosocial aspects of medicine, and biopsychosocial aspects specifically of inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, uh, this uh, particular program, I think, is, uh, uh, is unique because uh, we have asked uh, six representatives from six of many uh, alternative approaches to, uh, to traditional medicine, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, to uh, talk about their fields of interest and uh, their experiences and uh, uh, what we might learn from these. And before I even begin, I just need to reassure uh, that we're all on the same. There is no one answer. Just like there's no one right religion, there's no one right baseball team to follow. Uh, the, you know, different. Uh, we go into a department store, and there's many sizes of shirts and many colors, and uh, everybody buys different ones. It's like life is a, a horse race. You know, we it wouldn't survive if people all thought the same thing. So I don't expect uh, 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 a winner or a uh, it's it's to become a little more saturated and immersed in the in some of the options that are there. But what are we talking about when we talk about these these options? And if I've forgotten any housekeeping things, Bill, uh, uh, Stacy, please, please, please let me know. Um, That's only a laser pointer. <clears throat> Thank you. So I, I, I wanted to begin to set the scene for just a few minutes by talking about a concept uh, that is thrown about all the time called quality of life. How's your quality of life? How, how is your quality of life? And uh, basically, uh, everybody knows what we mean. And if I ask anybody, what do we mean? We're not entirely sure of what we mean by the quality of life then. So, I think it's very important because if we're going to look and think about various approaches to helping patients with inflammatory bowel disease, caregivers who have family members with inflammatory bowel disease, we're really talking about what can we do to improve the quality of life, which I will help define. Uh, uh, the, the World Health Organization says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. That's true. Not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And that's the important part. It's just not, oh, I'm in remission. And I still may have a lousy quality of life, but still may need more to uh, provide internal support for what is a hard word to define, but we all know what it is, and that is wellness. Uh, and and how much wellness can you have? You know, the answer is as much as you can get. Uh, 
This slide is intended to sort of bring out everything that I think of in terms of uh, uh, the Western world. And I represent uh, uh, traditional medicine, meaning I was trained at a, a standard medical university that I've gone through all the training, and I teach Western medicine, but I have uh, an appreciation for the fact that it does not provide everything. And in fact, it may provide only a small segment of what we can do to improve the quality and experience of our lives. Uh, looking back at my brief career, uh, it was just one generation before me where the treatment for colitis was place the patient in bed in a hospital, separate them from the family, put them to bed, and uh, if you had access to IV fluids, that probably be a good idea. Uh, then came, uh, if, uh, go, I, you should know that uh, lying down is, uh, is a primary treatment for diarrhea. It's, just, I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting. There was some sense behind it. Uh, it worked to some degree. Separating from the family was because everyone thought at that time that there was some kind of a, uh, an emotional component to it, for which there is, but not necessarily with the causation that was thought about in the 1930s and 40s. In early 50s. Uh, so, you know, then we got prednisone, and oh, that made a big difference. And uh, when I entered the scene, it was sort of prednisone and, and uh, sulfasalazine. And, and then uh, again, like late 70s, six mecapapurine, and what we call thiopurine. And, and there was some, oh, we have a couple more choices here. But it wasn't until 1998. 20 years ago that we got our first biological agent, and now we have a host of biological agents which treat the inflammation. And that's good, and that's what we do in the Western world. And we would like to do more, we would like to support, we would like to, to provide everything, but we know we don't, and that's the window that we're going to be looking for uh, today. This particular slide. Uh, Is uh, uh, I don't know if it, it's it's a button on top. Button on the top. So uh, uh, I call this the anatomy of an illness. Uh, what? What, what comprises uh, an illness? Well, the symptoms, severity, and you can call, you can be uh, a parent, a brother, a sister, a child of a patient, and still put yourself into the same model because it may be, the, the, the symptoms may not be pain, diarrhea, bleeding, and all the things that we think and talk about, but it may be anxiety or depression or uh, uh, issues of, uh, of how to cope uh, in various ways. So symptom severity is part of the illness. The intensity, how much, how bad, how frequent, what is, how long does it go on? That's obvious. Okay, that's the physical intense part of it. Uh, then we have the ability to function. Can we function in three realms? The realm of work, love, and play. Work means whatever we do. I mean, obviously, if we have careers, that's, that's work. We may be a student, we, uh, we may be a parent, a home uh, 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 individual, raising a family, uh, but it's work. It goes into that category. Uh, love is a relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean an in intimate uh, relationship, but it's relationship with people. That, that's, that's, that's where the love comes in. And play is what do we like to do? If we want to sit home and watch Netflix, do we like to go to Dodger Stadium, do we go to museums, it, 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 what do we do for recreation? So those are the ability, can we do these things? Can we participate in our work? Can we participate in our relationships? Can we participate in our recreational activities? And there's the key is coming up right here. The quality of life depends on the satisfaction we have with how we function in work, play, and love. So we know they're all there. And yep, I could get to the grocery store. Uh, I, I could do it. 
the Huawei was I exhausted when I came home. Uh, I don't really want to see these people on Friday night. You know, I'd rather stay home. Uh, uh, so it's it's how we function and how we derive satisfaction. And this, to me, well, all of the point of the slide is you take these three bad above, and that's what we now call the burden of illness. The burden <laughs> of illness is that uh, sense of what's this all about? What's it doing to me? And uh, uh, we're going to focus here today on what can we do outside of uh, uh, treating the inflammation to uh, improve the, the quality of, of our life. So there are many models of medicine, but in the Western world, we think of two of them, the medical model. And the medical model is basically uh, the most important thing in the classical medical model is what is the diagnosis and what is the treatment? Perhaps in between, what are the diagnostic studies that we can do to determine the diagnosis and the treatment? That's the medical model. It lacks a great deal. The alternative is the biopsychosocial model, where the focus is the well being of the patient. What is helping the patient, which may be different than just simply the diagnosis and the treatment? And it involves what are the what are the the home situation, the emotional state, the cultural issues that may be behind any particular uh, patient's life, uh, their fears, their wishes, it takes in who they are. And so uh, uh, the biopsychosocial model takes more time and there's all kinds of impediments to it. Uh, uh, the time, the money that's involved with time, the, uh, I really haven't been trained in this area. Uh, it's somebody else's job. I wear a white coat. I'm a professor. I, that's not my job. There's all kinds of impediments, but the biopsychosocial model would theoretically get us closer, but it still doesn't address all the aspects of it. If I had a slide that would say uh, a pie, I would say that Western medicine, even the biopsychosocial uh, parts of medicine, would consume a segment of the pie, but the rest of the pie is kind of unknown. It fills in the matrix between the physical symptom, the emotional symptom, and that's what we're going to attempt to address today. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the uh, choices of the individuals uh, uh, that the organization created with today was just, just really, really excellent, and uh, it would be fun to hear. Uh, I'm going to ask each speaker to try and contain to 20 minutes so that we can have some questions and interactions uh, that would be uh, useful uh, to the group. And uh, uh, that's my job is to be the sergeant at arms, so to speak. So we're going to begin uh, with uh, Kelly Brown, who uh, is here. Uh, she teaches mindfulness, a word that we all know, but do we know? Do we understand? She teaches mindfulness at the UCLA Mindfulness Awareness Research Center and has been a practitioner for some 20 years or more. She also teaches uh, uh, on eMindful, which is a provider of online mindfulness training. And she has a specific interest and experience uh, in mindfulness-based chronic pain management, which I think is very important. No slides? No, I'll just me. Slides. Do you need a microphone? Yeah, sure. Right. I think, can everyone hear me? Okay. You can have it if you want. I'll have it at handy in case. Okay. So I'd like to begin just by inviting people to take a full breath in. Just take a breath here. I'll invite you to do that again. This time I want you to pay attention to the inhalation. How the breath comes into the body and through the nostrils. So breathing in again. Head north on Westport Drive toward Rosewood Avenue. And then we'll do that again. This time, paying attention to the exhalation. What does it feel like when you let go of the breath? Breathing in one more time. Letting 
exhale, and letting that exhale be long and strong in the body. So congratulations. You just demonstrated you have everything that you need to learn a little bit about mindfulness today. When we practice mindfulness, we don't manipulate the breath like that. But it's a little way of showing you what can happen when we do focus our attention on a sensation in the body like the breath. You might have noticed as you did that that you felt a little bit more concentrated. Did you feel a little bit more concentrated? What did you feel in your body as you did that? I felt my chest rise and then this collapse. Yeah, so rising and falling in the chest, a little bit of relaxation. Did you have a comment? Relaxation. Yeah. So this is one of the tools we have when we practice mindfulness, directing our attention, feeling sensations in the body, and you notice there's some response, the body responds. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mindfulness and meditation, and then we'll practice some things together. And when I give talks like this, corporations or in long terms, I often think that when I say the words mindfulness or meditation, there are thought bubbles going over people's heads, and in them are images of monks in orange robes and swamis in white turbans. And those images aren't necessarily inaccurate, but they're not very current because the faces and places of mindfulness are really changing. Mindfulness is being taught in major corporations like Google, Aetna, General Mills, Target. It's being taught in the US military. So soldiers returning from war, looking for help in dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome are being taught meditation and mindfulness. It's in schools. I teach kids as young as kindergartners all up uh, to high schoolers. And even professional athletes are using meditation as a means of improving their performance. So all that's to say you're in good company in learning about meditation and mindfulness today. And it's moving in the mainstream more and more because people, as Dr. Feldman said, are looking for tools to help them function. And what we know from the science is that meditation has a number of impacts on our physiology, our mental and emotional well-being. So we know that it helps us regulate our emotions helps us reduce anxiety and stress. Particularly, it's helpful in preventing a relapse of depression. We know it has many cognitive benefits. It helps us focus. It helps us have more mental flexibility, reduces the confirmation bias. It also impacts our physiology. So we know from research that it lowers the blood pressure, it boosts the immune system, it helps us um, to uh, have more ease in the body. So it invites the relaxation response. Also, we know it impacts pain. So meditators have an ability to attenuate the pain in terms of the unpleasantness and the intensity of it. And I'll detail some specific studies in a few moments, but it might help you to know what is mindfulness, what is meditation. When we're mindful, what we're doing is we're paying attention in a specific way. Paying attention in the present moment with an attitude, openness, curiosity, and without judgment. And all of you have been mindful. Everyone here. It's part of being human. How many of you have been at the beach, for example, like, and felt the sun on your back and, and really sensed the waves and just felt really pleasant in nature? I don't have any experience mm -hmm. that. How many of you have been at work and really engaged in a project, so much so, or a hobby at home that you looked up at the clock and you, know, you don't know where time went? This was a little hard. How many of you have been really pissed off? <laughs> and you, you felt this in your body. You felt tension or heat, maybe you saw the words as you were about to say them and you saw you notice this and you, and you responded instead of reacted. Anyone do that? So these are all facets of mindfulness. Mindfulness is a bit like a gem with many different facets. And when we meditate, what we're doing is we're, we're training in this capacity to be more mindful in our daily life. There's nothing exotic about it. It's a bit like going to the gym for a month. When you go to the gym and you lift a weight, building that bicep muscle to have strength. That's a byproduct of going to the gym. So when you meditate, you might attend to a neutral object like the breath, or sensations, or sounds. And your mind wanders, you bring it back to that object of your focus. It's a little bit like training the brain, a little bit like doing a rep in the gym. And the byproduct of this is this quality of mindfulness. That being said, we need to practice it, because most of us are pretty mindless, and it's not all our fault. Our brains are kind of hardwired this way, which is both kind of frightening and magical. In fact, social scientists will tell you that about 90% of what we do is just out of habit, automatic. You know, we can drive a car, we learn how to do that, and then it's automated for us, right? We can 
send a text and then you know how to do that. The brain is very neurologically efficient this way. But it can also get us into trouble because a lot of the mental and emotional patterns that sometimes agitate us, that cause us stress, also operate out of our awareness. I have this story of a woman who uh, who cook a pot roast, and every time she did this, she would slice the end off the pot roast and put it in the oven. The daughter was kind of like, oh, why do you do that? She said, well, that's the way my mother did it. So the daughter was curious. She calls the grandmother and says, grandmother, why do you slice the end off the pot roast when you put it in the oven? Well, that's the way my great-grandmother did it. Long living family, still curious daughter, calls the great-grandmother. Great-grandmother, why do you slice the end off the pot roast when you put it in the oven? She said, well, that's the only way it would fit in the pan. <laughs> You know, so sometimes our habits, we don't even come by them honestly. Like they're handed down to us. You know, your dad was hot tempered, so you have a little bit of temper. Your mom was kind and you're kind. Not all that. But mindfulness gives us the capacity to see our own patterns in operation and to begin to have a choice whether or not we want to engage in them. What's false? What's unfold? What contributes, as Dr. Feldman said, to our quality of life? And this is why it's a practice. Because we're, we're habitual creatures by nature. But we can learn this, and learning this has some distinct benefits, particularly in relationship to chronic pain. And I'll talk a little bit about the studies now. Mindfulness and chronic pain have a long standing relationship. In fact, secular mindfulness really got its beginning uh, working with chronic pain patients. Jeff, Dr. John Cabot Zinn, who uh, trained in mindfulness and was working in a hospital in the 80s in Boston. Uh, came in touch with a lot of patients who were getting better, physicians and being connected, and they developed this course, an eight-week course that has become mindfulness-based stress reduction. And as these patients went through the course, they researched what was the impact of taking mindfulness and, and meditation class. And what they found was that many of the patients in this group uh, had a reduction in pain. Some of whom who didn't have a reduction in pain had an improvement in the quality of life. They were able to cope with the pain better. And this outcome has been duplicated in many, many studies. Um, I was trained in mindfulness-based chronic pain management. That's a program that's uh, adopted in Canada. By the way, the, the health care system in Canada pays for that course. So 20,000 people have taken that course. Dr. Jackie gardner nix who founded that program, researched about 400 of her patients and found that after taking the course, 33% of them were able to reduce their medication. About another 18% were able to return to work. Some of that was part time work, but they were able to regain and reclaim some of their daily routine. More recent studies have shown that we have a greater understanding of what's happening in the brain as we practice mindfulness and meditation because meditators respond differently to pain. So there was a study done where they took people who had never meditated before and invoked pain. They gave them a, a heat sensor on the back of the calves that jolted them with 120 degrees of heat. And, pleasant. and they scan their brains and notice the activity in the brain. Then they taught them meditation, not a lot, just about four days, 20 minutes of work of meditation. And then they had them meditate and they invoked this pain uh, response again. And those studies showed that the areas of the brain that were responsible for the pain activation were not as active, that somehow these meditators were able to attenuate the centers in their brain that responded to. And people in the study said that the more pleasantness of pain was reduced by about 57%, about 47% or 40 said that it wasn't as intense. This research is encouraging, but what I always say about the research is I don't think research and cheerleading go together. So we need better research, more research, and I think the press has gotten ahead in terms of its reporting on the research um, because mindfulness is still a relatively new field in terms of the science. So my encouragement to you is be a laboratory of one. As we practice you know, some meditation in a few moments, notice what's happening. What do you feel in your body? What do you feel in your heart and your mind? And then from there, make your decision about could this be helpful to me? Because I can tell you chocolate ice cream is sweet, that it's cool, that it tastes delicious, but until you try it, you won't know if it's something you like or if you want to keep eating it. So with that, let's let's practice a bit, and I'll leave some time for questions. So when I teach kids, I always tell them to sit like a mountain when they practice mindfulness. And that means just have your your spine a little bit upright, not up tight. Your hands can be held softly in your lap, 
And at any time, if you feel uncomfortable in your body, please feel free to shift. You know, we don't have to do this in a rigid way, but sitting in this way supports our attention. If you have difficulty attending to the breath, or if it feels uncomfortable, feel free to listen to the sound of my voice. So you have some choices here. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. If you want to keep your eyes open, that's fine. If not, you can also close them. Okay. Again, some flexibility and choice there. If you hold your eyes open, you might just want to hold them in a soft gaze so that you're not looking around the room. So I invite you just again to take a deep breath so you can really connect to the sensations of breathing. I do that again just to feel the breath moving in the body. your attention to, to feel the body itself so you might devote some attention just to sensation around your eyes and noticing what that feels like. If there's tension and gripping in the eyes, just soften the eyes. Soften the jaw. Any sensations in the upper back and that band of muscles between the shoulder blades. Heaviness or pressure here, or just an openness. Just notice what you notice. Connect with the breathing in the front of your body. So feeling the breath in your chest or your abdomen. Feel the weight of your body in the chair, the force of gravity working on your body and the connection of your body to the seat. Feel your feet. Feel the sensations of your feet, your toes against your shoes, the soles of your feet on the floor. I will invite you now just to connect with the sensations of breathing again. Wherever they're most noticeable in your body, this might be in your abdomen, in your chest, or at the tip of your nose, the sensation of the air moving out of the nose. Just feel the nose. And just rest your attention here, just like a butterfly rests on a cloud. Just lightly rest your attention on the sensations of breathing. Thoughts might be coming and going, sounds might be coming and going. You can notice those too. You don't have to, to worry about what I'm thinking. But when we notice we've gotten really entangled in a series of thoughts, just gently guide your attention back <coughs> to the sensation of breathing. We're breathing and we're knowing it. We're sitting and we're knowing it. Also listening, and we're knowing that too. So, in a moment, I'll bring a ton of our those are brief practice, but before I do, just check in with yourself and notice if anything shifted from when you first came. your mind feel like? What does your body feel like? 
things have shifted and they shifted in a good way. Let's let's just make sure. Now, what if I could help them do this again? What if I could help them just to take three breaths again? What did you notice as you, you paid attention to your breath? How did your body feel? What did your mind feel like? You might have had lots of thoughts. Your body could have been agitated, or you could have maybe felt a settling happening. There's no right or wrong answer, but just to check in, what did some of you notice after doing that brief bit of meditation together? <coughs> yeah, I find it really hard to quiet my mind. Sure, it's that place where I'm not hearing. Anyone else notice your mind was? It's a sense of calm. It took a while, you know, but I feel, you know, less anxious. It just, and this is the first time I'm ever doing something like this. So it took a while, but I did, I definitely feel less anxious. Though. So our minds are very busy. They're designed to think. Some reports say we think as many as 50,000, 70,000 thoughts a day. The mind's a bit like a puppy. It's kind of untrained. You know, go flopping around wherever it wants to go. And part of what we're doing in mindfulness is really training that part of our mind, getting it to heal. My friend has a, a pit bull, it's a very fierce looking dog, but it's a, it's a lovely dog. She spent a lot of time training it. And we'll go walking on the beach with this muscle bound pit bull and we'll get distracted by a smell or a shoelace or something. And she'll just say calmly, leave it, Nina, leave it. That dog comes right Walking with more of the dog, it's lost. Leave it, leave it, leave it. So, this is a bit like our mind. It takes time for the mind to settle, and that's what we're learning to do. That's how we're training the mind. Very helpful when working with chronic pain because we know that pain is not just sensation, it's all the stories we tell ourselves about the pain. Oh no, it's happening again. I can't, I'm not going to be able to survive this thing. So, with, with mindfulness, we have the capacity to begin to see some of this happening. And we can intervene and say, you know what? Leave it, leave it, leave it. Come back to the breath, come back to feeling the sensations of our feet on the floor. This is the practice. And so we train in this in a meditation city, and then in our daily life, we have this capacity to let go of the discursive thinking. Let go of the thinking that's not wholesome, that's not helping us. Because that type of thinking, particularly in relationship to pain, not only is agitating the mind, but it's agitating the body. Because every time we go on a loop, of spiral of thinking, which is how the brain works. We're constricting the body, we're feeling the tension of the body, and this exacerbates the sensation of pain. Very normal to have a very busy mind. I have a busy mind. It's helpful. Thoughts are, are not in and of themselves problematic. I mean, they gave us Snickers bars, satellites, you know, all sorts of things. But we want to have the capacity to identify which thoughts are helpful and which aren't. This is the practice of mind. Some of you might have also noticed, oh, I'm starting to feel some relaxation in the body. That's interesting. The body loves attention. It loves warm, kind attention. So just devoting some attention to parts of the body, even parts of the body that are in pain, can generate some ease when we can begin to collaborate with the body. For those of us who are in pain, for those of us who are caring for someone in pain, the bodies become kind of a battle ground. Be quite angry and feel betrayed by uh, the body. So one of the things mindfulness in my experience has done is help me personally come into a, a state of collaboration with this body, which is always sending us information. It's a resource. How, how am I doing? Am I hungry? Am I tired? What am I feeling? So as we begin to learn the language of the body, which is sensation, and we attend to this in a meditation sitting, we get a little bit more clear. And we can kind of begin to understand, oh, you know, uh, interesting. When I go into work, I start to feel nauseous. I wonder what that is about. When I eat this, I, I don't have uh, such a great feeling. What's that about? And we, we get to collaborate with the body and get to use it as a resource of information. Any other comments about how that practice felt? I'm just going to do one other short practice, and then if you have any questions, and I'll be here during the break too. I want to 
going to teach you a practice called stop. Because this is a practice you can do in the midst of your day. You don't have to meditate to do it. It's a very simple practice, but really, really helpful. Stop is an acronym. It sounds for stop, take a breath, observe, and proceed. Every time you see stop sign, you can actually do this practice. So we're going to do kind of a long version and a short version of this practice. We can do it standing, we can do it sitting, we can do it sitting. So just invite everyone to stop what they're doing. Okay, then just stop. And take a full breath in. Just observe. Do you feel in your body? Do you catch a glimpse of a sensation? You know, it's a fleeting thought in your mind. Just pausing and stopping. We can do this in a very fast way. Stop. Take a breath in. Just observe. And then proceed. We can do this even faster. We can stop. Take a breath in. Maybe we just feel our feet. A lot of mindfulness is stopping. Stopping the automaticity of our being. Just stopping. And sometimes that can make a world of difference. It's a story that's kind of connected with this practice. It's a, I think it really elements the story to understanding how this practice can be helpful. An army surgeon who was trained in anger management in this practice. And he was in a checkout line. And it was a 12 item checkout line. And the woman ahead of him had like 30 items. Like, oh my God, come on. This is ridiculous. And he started to get a link. He could feel this. And to make it worse, the woman had a baby, and she was passing the baby to the checker, and they were cooing and eyeing over the baby. He said, oh, my God. You can feel it. He says, oh, damn it. I'm going to stop. So he stopped. He took a breath. He observed. And then he kind of proceeded. By the time he got to the checkout line, he managed to say to the cashier, which even was a cute baby. And she went out, and she smiled, and she said, oh, thank you. That's my baby. My husband was killed in Afghanistan last year. And my mother brings the baby by once a day so I can be with her. So sometimes pausing makes all the difference. Rubenstein, the great pianist, was being interviewed by a journalist. And he was elderly late in his life. And she knew that she only had just one question, you know, a few questions she could ask him. So she boiled it down and she said, what makes your music so great? I said, oh, that's easy. I play the notes like everyone else. It's the pauses between the notes and all the difference. So the pauses in our life really make the difference. If you're a caregiver of someone who's ill, pausing, noticing the anxiety in you, it's very helpful in relating to them, openly, lovingly, noticing the frustration and anger in you. Very helpful before you can really be caring to them. Certainly if you're in pain, stopping, notice what's happening, when it's happening, very helpful to bring a little bit of kindness toward yourself, to maybe take some, some action that might be helpful. Also really helpful to notice the good moments of our lives. Even if we're in pain, as Dr. Feldman said, there's this whole quality of life. You know, and a lot of that we might find ourselves really able to participate in. So stopping and noticing the sweet moments, the good moments, very, really, very helpful to raise the riverbed of our well-being. Kurt Vonnegut said that when life is sweet and pleasant, please pause and say to yourself out loud, if this isn't nice, what is? If this isn't nice, what is? Sometimes, even in the midst of feeling pain, even in the midst of the ardor of caring for someone in pain or sweetness. So we can stop. We can notice this. Notice it in our body. We can notice the intimacy that happens when we're caring for someone in pain. And even if we're in pain, we can notice maybe other parts of our body that are okay. We might feel really awful in some ways, but our teeth feel great. Here they are working really hard on our behalf with teeth, you know. Most of the time feel pretty good. So we can shift our attention in that way and, and bring in a little bit of peace. So I'll just Leave a few moments for some questions, broader questions if you have any, and then the next wonderful participant will take over. But if you have any questions about 
mindfulness or meditation to see if you feel like those. Well, what's an appropriate amount of time to spend with this practice to actually get people <clears throat> benefit? I think a minute is great. <laughs> you know, uh, I think if you can do a minute of meditation, it's a success. Start with five minutes. You know, when you begin something, uh, you know, with the gym analogy, you don't go in and lift, you know, 500 pounds. You might just lift a simple barbell. I think taking three breaths is really helpful. I think that's a wonderful intervention. Stopping, you know. Start wherever you are and, and begin. And short times, many times, is the way the brain builds habit. And it's the way that we gain self-efficacy. It's the way that we gain confidence in our ability to really uh, do something and, and ultimately build it into something. In terms of the study, you know, what is the magical number? I've heard everything from 27 minutes. You know, in my own personal practice, I've, I've sat 20 minutes, I've sat 45 minutes a day. I'm in a period now where I'm sitting longer because it just feels really good to me now. So I've played with the time in my own mind, and um, I would encourage you just to begin. Yeah, following up on that, what time of day? Time of day, yeah. To me, that's also very individual, just like Dr. Feldman said, you know, we're all individuals and different things work differently for us. Uh, some people love to do this in the morning as a way to set the table for their day. Uh, I have a daughter, so the morning's a busy time. I tend to sit at night, but I sit in the day. I sit in my car, I sit wherever I can. Um, I would play and practice with that and see what works for you. Sometimes if you're sitting too close to bedtime, it can invite and induce sleep which might be very beneficial for you if you have insomnia or a hard time sleeping. That might be a, a tactical approach to use. If you find you're really nodding off and your attention is not well sustained, then you might not want to sit or close to bedtime. You may might work with that close to bedtime. Your recommendation on a guide or a resource? Yeah, so I have some handouts back there. And one of the great things about this moving into mainstream Tons of resources. So UCLA, uh, the Mindful Awareness Research Center, has free uh, downloadable guided meditations it's as little as, I think, two minutes, but they have a five minute one that's lovely. Uh, you can download that on your phone and access that. It's a secular, wonderful uh, way to practice. Uh, Insight Timer is another app that is very popular. Uh, it comes with a lovely uh, timer, and then there are uh, Guided meditations on there as well. As well. Um, great books, many books. Uh, Full Catastrophe is kind of a classic written by John Cabot Zinn. And there's some that I've referenced on my handout too. Uh, Dr. Jackie Gardner Nix, who uh, designed the program I was trained in, has a book called The Mindful Solution to Pandemic. Uh, that's really, really a good book as well. Yeah. With your teeth. So adults are definitely different than children, and when children are anxious and in pain, uh, relaxation, that word itself, you want to, they're going to punch you. So, <coughs> punch you. Like, oh, that, yes. Re yeah. Say, hey, relax, and it's like, don't yeah. tell me to relax because, um, and they think the whole process is just done. So, how, you know, how do you get into teenagers, mid twenty type people who are dealing with all the other issues? That for you to walk up and just go take a breath with me, you need to step yeah. like ten feet back. Yeah, <laughs> um, but, and I'll be brief here. If we can talk at the break, if you want to learn more, I model it yourself. Be an example to them. I don't like to agendize mindfulness. You know, it's kind of antithetical to the practice itself. So model it. Practice yourself. Let them see you doing it. Gee, I'm really getting stressed. I'm, I'm going to take a few breaths and just feel what this is like and, and re, re, regroup here. Or let them see you meditate. You know what? I'm going to go meditate. Please don't bother me. I'll be in here for five minutes. Oh, what, what can you do with your breath? That's one way to open the door to it. There are many ways we can practice with kids. They're playful and simple and easy. But I don't think uh, coming at it with a should is, is, is helpful. And so my first is just do it yourself. Do it yourself and let the results of that practice be an invitation to them to give it a try. And we can talk at the break more specifically about that. I've seen classes being advertised. Do you offer any classes at all? Yeah, I do. I teach through uh, Mark and um, I'll be teaching again in January. I'm not teaching the next series. And you can talk to me at the break. And I'm also interested in, in getting a class together specifically for chronic pain. 
communications, and maybe we can we can collaborate in that regard in any year. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, that was indeed a really lovely presentation of the area. Uh, just wanna, uh, I, I love the analogy of the puppy because I've always called it monkey noise. The noise is there, folks. I mean, it's, we're all busy with things that come and go, and it discourages people to find uh, uh, activities. And you just have to say, okay, that's me. Let it go. I think the one point that I wanted to emphasize is that when you participate, there are two things I'd like to say. One is that that uh, it feels very relaxing anytime you uh, exhale. It's it's a free, free. You just relax. But relaxation is not the same as losing alertness and. You may find that you're very relaxed physically and physiologically, but your mind is actually quite alert, and that is a, a state of being that is to be reinforced. Uh, I, think it's I find, because I've worked with kids a lot uh, in the past, is that uh, I used a, uh, a, a belly lump approach, which is, uh, it, and first, yeah, God, they, to your question, they have to want to do it, they have to want to buy in. But if you if you start to take the, your your initial inspiration from inhalation uh, uh, from the belly button and fill in and then out through the belly button, uh, kids pick up on that very easily. Kids, teenagers, and uh, very useful technique. And waiting for elevators is a great place to practice. Traffic lights and four or five. <laughs> they're they're really they're really very. They're very good places to back the short. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we're going to hear about uh, acupuncture, which we've all heard about all of our lives, but do we really know it? Do we really understand it? Elizabeth Fine has uh, got her undergraduate degree in Chinese language and Asian studies from Columbia, got a master's in social work, and clinically. Uh, currently is a candidate for a doctorate in Chinese medicine and acupuncture, and she's very experienced and has worked with many medical patients in addition to looking forward to the So much, Dr. Feldman. Um, what he didn't say, and if you, some of you have read the, the uh, my bio, is that I'm the mother of a 15 year old with Crohn's who uh, is under Dr. Ramazani's wonderful care, Morgan, as well. And we've been there, he was diagnosed when he was eight and he's 15 now. And I'm also the wife of 25 years of uh, my, my um, husband, who's my son's dad. Who uh, also has Crohn's. So we're, uh, I finally refer to us as a Crohn's family. Okay. So I'm here um, in both respects today as a um, person who understands a lot of uh, what we all go through, as well as being a, um, an acupuncturist. So I'm really excited, thrilled really, to be here and to uh, give you the information that I can. And I'm hoping it's going to be a very hands on experience today because my idea is that you can leave here with some useful things to do. So today we're going to discuss what is Oriental medicine. Like Dr. Feldman said, this, we hear so much about it right now. Um, but really, what is it? How does it work? We're going to look into a little bit of the mechanisms, how it can help specifically for IBD patients, and also some simple exercises and also some acupressure. So again, that you can take home with you and use for yourself or for your loved ones because my experience also is that everyone's going to so many appointments and I absolutely encourage anyone to come and get acupuncture, um, either with me or with anyone out there who's qualified. 
But the truth is, is that we all have so many appointments to go to um, for Crohn's that sometimes it's hard to get to them, and I want to be able to help you in a very real and concrete way today. So acupuncture in oriental medicine includes a lot of different aspects. Um, there is acupuncture, of course. There's um, some Tai Chi and Qigong exercises, which we're going to look into. And there's also Chinese nutrition. There's cupping, which got kind of famous when Michael Phelps was on the scene, and he had all these big circles on his back. Um, so people are always asking for cupping now. We're not going to discuss too much of that today. We're going to focus mainly on acupuncture and some Tai Chi Chi exercises. Tai Chi Qigong exercises. There's also something called Tui Na, which is a um, Chinese form of massage. So most of you today here are very familiar with the symptoms of Crohn's and colitis. And I think this is pretty accurate for what many of us go through, which is that the, the uh, up top part, on top of the, the iceberg, is that um, people generally think Crohn's and colitis is about abdominal pain and cramps, and that is true, but Many of us and our, you know, our loved ones are experiencing all these other symptoms, and this is what people don't see. And this is, of course, psycho-emotional as well as physical. Um, and um, oriental medicine can help with a lot of these symptoms. And you know, this is the, you know, the isolation I think that happens because um, on the outside it just people think, oh, you know, you have some some pain and cramps, but it's obviously so much more than that, including depression. Um, of course, digestive issues and all these other things, skin disorders um, and fatigue and all these things that we deal with. And, you know, again, we're talking about this kind of biopsycho uh, social model and um, acupuncture really fits right into that. And oriental medicine, sometimes I say oriental medicine, sometimes I say Chinese medicine. There is no perfect word for it right now, so that is interchangeable today, so I don't need to confuse you. So all these aspects of physical, emotional, spiritual, social, and mental um, for the symptoms of IBD can, be, can really help with that, um, oriental medicine. In fact, um, the Chinese um, medicine is particularly good at helping with these, um, these kind of psycho-emotional issues. And you know, the ancient Chinese knew that you had to treat the whole um, person at all levels in order to create harmony in the, in the body and in the family. And in fact, the word for spirit, which is right here, I know how to use a pointer, yay, uh, Shen. This word, it, is, it, it actually translates as spirit, but if you're saying that someone is, is um, mentally unwell, it's actually considered, the Chinese translation is a sickness of the spirit as well. So I think that's quite interesting that you can't really separate them. In Chinese medicine, absolutely not. It's all related. And of course, it's true for caregivers as well. Um, as we know, this is a family disease. Um, so, look, there's been um, more and more evidence and a, a lot of um, hype and, and, and um, uh, words right now about this gut brain access and about the, um, the gut being the second brain. And I'm not here to really speak on this as an expert or on the research, but it really um, it does correlate as well with Chinese medicine, which is why I wanted to present it. Um, because there is this strong message from the brain and it has an influence on motility, which has to do with how the gut is moving or not moving and secretions and absorption of nutrients. And then in part, the, 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 we talk about the flora and the microbiota and how that is influencing things like neurotransmitters and how that relates to stress, anxiety, and mood and behavior. And even in the regular population, you're hearing people talk about this now. And, that's when people say things to me like, oh, well, you can just fix arms with probiotics. And that's when I wanted to get really you know, frustrated. Because within my world, as an acupuncturist, um, there are people who believe that um, Chinese medicine, you know, that, that I should only be using like the either or thing, right? That I can just cure this with Chinese medicine. I just want everyone to know that I integrate. I believe in integration. Um, my son and my husband both are on biologics. And I think that there's a gray area here. And I think there's a way of having supportive care so that they can work together. This, again, is not an either or thing. There's a big gray area, and it is different for everyone. And it usually entails not just acupuncture um, or mindfulness, but many things together. So totally in agreement with that. So the reason I want to show you that, though, is that acupuncture has its own axis between the brain and the gut and the body. And the way acupuncture works 
um, and this is um, the mechanisms are being proven now in evidence-based research, is that when you put an acupuncture needle in here, it's like a keyboard, okay? That's like the computer that's tapping messages into your brain, which is the computer, and then those messages are gonna get carried out into the different signals in the body, which affects the nervous system. It regulates digestion. It's analgesic, meaning that it helps to control pain and it can also reduce inflammation. And of course, we wanna see more and more research about this. So how does it do that? So this is a word that's being thrown a lot around, chi. Um, it seems like it's on even green drinks and things at Whole Foods. And um, so chi is, I looked this up in Wikipedia. I couldn't figure out how am I gonna explain chi to everyone. It was considered, and even Wikipedia has an answer for it. It's a material energy or a life force, an energy flow. It's the central underlying principle in Oriental medicine and martial arts. So where does this chi go? What does it do? And actually, they are finding ways now to measure chi, chi which is quite fascinating. So these pathways through here are known as meridians, and these freeways carry that vital energy, and they are on the surface of the body is where the acupuncture points are, and they also go deeply into the body. And again, that computer, the keyboard is typing in messages into the brain. And they also have a physical and an emotional component. Um, this is more complex than what I can get into, but for instance, let me give you an example. Um, somebody has asthma, and they come in for, um, they've experienced a lot of grief in their life. And if you think about it, when somebody's crying a lot, right, they're like this kind of thing, right, that does activate respiration. Um, so there are other parallels with the liver being a lot about anger. And again, these are meridians. They are named after an organ. That does not mean that something is wrong with the organ itself, it could be. But primarily, this, these are freeways that carry chi. So when you look at the 405 freeway and the 101 freeway and there's a traffic jam, you can have a problem with that chi getting stuck at the Getty Center. That's going to be a problem with the freeway all the way down to San Diego, right? So just to give you a sense of how the system works, and it's very complicated, and yes, I had to learn all these points. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of study. Okay, so how about some, some more concrete information? How small or big is an acupuncture needle? Well, they're very tiny, you know, they're, they're, they're very, the gauge is extremely thin. It's kind of like a, a, almost as fine as a hair. I think this is important because most patients with IBD have gotten stuck with needles so many times. Um, some are needle, needle phobic and it's a big thing. It's, a, you know, it's very, it produces a lot of anxiety. Um, you don't have to do acupuncture at all. You can do acupressure, um, but the needles are very thin. You also don't have to have many needles. Um, you can use as little as even two needles or four needles. And again, you can always do massage and acupressure. Especially in the hospital, you know, patients are used to getting stuck with a lot of needles. It's hard as a practitioner to go in and to have to give them more needles. Most Crohn's patients and colitis patients are so, at this point, they just want to try anything. But I am very aware of what it's like for patients to have to have more needles. How old do you need to be to try acupuncture? So I've worked on patients as young as 14. I would prefer that they're through adolescence a little bit before they have real acupuncture with needles. But anywhere around 12 or 14 is fine. Um, but again, there are lots of other pediatric methods of using acupressure points that's not related to you know, having needles. So when you walk uh, down Robertson Boulevard, you often see these um, reflexology shops where people go for foot massage, right? And so that's called a microsystem. And acupuncture, that's a part of acupuncture. And there can be a microsystem on any part of the body. The ear is a very strong way of being able to access um, um, different physiological, um, different ways of being able to work in the body. So if you look at it, it's an upside down human or or a, like a fetus originally is what it was. And all these points here, this is all musculoskeletal here, this is similar to what happens with the foot. So I'm just trying to give you an example. Um, and all of in here, in the inside of the ear, 
these are more where the abdominal points are. So, and there's been some research done, actually there's been quite a bit of research done on the ear and why it works and it has to do with the, the vagus nerve. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that today, but it's quite fascinating. Um, so one thing that you can do is um, you can act like a monkey and massage your ears. So if everybody wants to try this, you can literally just grab one ear over the top of your head on the top, and then you can grab the earlobe on the bottom, and then you can never act like a monkey, right? You can massage your ears. You don't have to do it this way. You can also do it like this. Oh. <laughs> so if you're having, or your your child is having abdominal pain, you can have them massage their ears specifically on this inside part. Yeah, like right in the middle, and just rub in there. And you don't have to think, oh my gosh, I don't know where the point is. Is this gonna work? You just try it. And you can also do any point around the ear. So ear massage is wonderful. Why do you think dogs like it so much? Don't they love having their ears massaged? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I'm showing you right now is so you can massage your ears. We're gonna look at a point now that's specific to it. This point is called Shenmen in Chinese. It translates into meaning spirit gate. Um, it is called the neuro gate as well. Uh, it's a lot of research done on this point. It's primarily good for pain and stress, specifically for anxiety. It's also being used in addiction protocols right now to help people with opioid addiction, and it's good for inflammation. So it's up in this little hollow in here, okay? And you can just use your fingernail, you can press on it. But again, if you don't know the exact point, that's okay too, just massage your ears. This is another point which is the seasick band point, right? If anyone goes on a cruise or something, a long trip, and they have the seasick band, sometimes pregnant women use them also. This point is called the inner gate. It's on a channel called the pericardium. Uh, what's interesting about this channel and is that it's the protector of the heart, right? And so this channel, this point, it's called P6, can be used when you feel like your heart isn't being protected emotionally, right? So for any kind of anxiety and stress, uh, but also specifically a lot of research done on nausea and vomiting. Um, so when nothing else is working and you're just trying to find something that will help, it's the middle of the night, you don't know what to do, you've tried many things, or you can't do anything until you can get some more meds or whichever, you can try using this point because it can help, especially if there's anxiety with the nausea. So you can do what I call the gang sign. You take your three fingers, put them here, right? This is how you find the point three fingers, and then it's right there, right? Again, if you're like, well, I don't remember what she said, you can just massage this area. Just massaging here. Another thing you can do is you can take a bean with a piece of tape on it, tape it on, and then you can push on it. And for little kids, maybe that's fun, right? This is another well-researched point. It's called Stomach 36. And it's called Zusam in Chinese, which means walk three miles. And it has some research behind it about elevate, elevating white blood cell count, boosting immunity. It's anti-inflammatory. It's very good for fatigue. That's one of the reasons it's called walk three miles. Right? This plant has been used literally for thousands of years for helping people to walk further in their life, right? And immune system-wise as well. So where this point is, is on the lateral side of the lower legs. So you just go down this channel on the outside of your legs. I'm gonna put my foot up here. It's just where this muscle is on the, on the outside, okay? And again, if you don't know exactly where the point is, you can take your, your four fingers and put it right where the kneecap is basically, and that's where it is. And if you push in there, you'll generally find some tender points. But again, you don't have to know the exact point because it's a whole freeway. So anywhere that you find uh, pain on that freeway in particular, if you find a point, you're massaging your son, and they're like, oh, that point really hurts, then massage on that point. Is it on the exterior or the interior? Yes, it's on what I call the lateral side, so it's on the, this muscle right here, on the outside. The inside has a lot of good points, too. In fact, you can just massage the legs. Massage the lower legs is a really good thing to do. So when I wash, this is a, um, I think I, this is going to explain a little bit more. We're going to do some exercises. This is about Qigong, which is um, similar to Tai Chi. In China, you know, there's quite a movement against something called uh, Falun Qigong. Okay, that has nothing to do with this, and I'm not 
presenting this as, you know, promoting anything. This is just the National Qigong Association. So we're going to just watch about a minute of this so we can see some, some interesting things about Qigong and specifically how um, relaxed it is and how gentle it is. So there are some more martial things in here, but I would like you to focus on how this is very gentle exercise. Welcome to the National Qigong Association's introductory video on the fundamentals of Qigong. The word Qigong is made up of two Chinese characters. The first word, Qi, is usually translated as the life force or vital energy that flows through all things in the universe. The second word, Gong, means accomplishment or skill that is cultivated through steady practice over time. Together, Qigong means cultivating energy skillfully. Qigong dates back over 5,000 years with its origins in China. There are hundreds of different systems of Qigong, but they can be categorized into three different schools, medical, martial, and spiritual. As a healing modality, it is one of the major branches of Chinese medicine. Some practices increase the Qi, others circulate it, use it to cleanse and heal the body, store it, or emit Qi to help heal others. Practices vary from the soft internal styles such as Tai Chi to the vigorous external styles such as Gong Fu. The slow, gentle movements of most Qigong forms can be easily adapted for the physically challenged and can be practiced by all age groups. Qigong creates an awareness of and influences dimensions of our being that are not part of traditional exercise programs. Unlike most exercises, Qigong involves the meridian system used in acupuncture and emphasizes the importance of adding mind intent and breathing techniques to physical movements. When these dimensions are added, the benefits of exercise increase exponentially. A growing body of research from both the East and the West conclusively proves that Qigong reduces stress, lowers hypertension, builds stamina, increases vitality, and enhances the immune system. Okay. So hopefully that gives you uh, uh, some information. I can figure out how to the screen. Oh. I don't have to the screen, sorry. No, it's just a little bit of this. Can you help? Perhaps? We're going to get up and do a couple exercises if you want to. This is just going to end. I just want to go back to the slideshow. Yeah. So, okay. Can I just AP? No, I am. That's okay. That's all right. As long as you guys are okay with it, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just finish it like that. Okay. So keep it simple. I want to teach you all some, just a few Qigong exercises. So now you understand something about Qi. You understand that it's a vital energy. You understand something about the meridians. And again, there's there's no, um, you can do this in literally in, in a hospital bed. You can do just your arms. You, you, elderly people do it, so it's not something you have to be at any particular place. Basically, wherever you're at at any given moment is, is just perfect. So the first one I'm going to teach you is called Shake, Rattle, and Roll. And if you feel low enough to get up and want to join me, that would be awesome. So I don't have to end my son. I'm sorry, I did not want to come today. I think he, was, he couldn't get out of bed, but I think he was too embarrassed to do this kind of thing with me being 15. Okay. So this is just called shake, rattle, and roll. Basically, you shake the chi in your body. So you just do this, right? And basically, anywhere where you feel tightness, you try to loosen it up. This just helps move the chi in your body. You feel it in your hands. You kick your legs. Usually, I like to take my hair out and I'll do this kind of thing, right? You could also do your ears. That's all you do. If you're feeling low energy or your kids are just feeling depressed, pumped out, you can just have them get up and shake around a little roll if they like the name of that too. So the next one is called tap, tap, tap. So basically, these are all the meridians that you saw on that picture. So you basically, you're just going to tap. Tap up. And you don't have to do 
to do any particular order. You just draw it everywhere. Like a sketch. Like this. Tap your body, tap your body, right? Yeah, so I'm just going to do the heart here. Also, a tapping thing. The ends of the fingers have a lot of points. You do this like this. You just tap your fingers together. Very good to access the brain. So that these points go to the brain. You can just do this again if you're feeling nervous. If you have something that you don't know, have to be somewhere. You have to use your mind. You're not feeling clear. You can do this. Okay. And of course, ear massage, like we discussed, always helpful. You can't think of anything else. Do some ear massage. Okay. Finger and hand stretching, because a lot of the meridians run through the hands, especially the heart, on the little pinky. So you take your hands and you just stretch. Seems like it's not even a jigong exercise, it's just an exercise that how they do the yoga to you. Just stretch every finger. And when you do that, you let me know if you actually feel your chest open up a little bit. I find that maybe you breathe better. You feel less anxious. So this is something you can do every day. It's also, of course, good for joint and hand pain as well. Okay. But the last thing I want to present, and then we're done, is something called lapping qigong. Um, I saw a, people, a group of people doing it this at the beach, which I just loved. It's also called like a lapping yoga. Um, this was a study that was done in Taiwan and on adolescents, and um, there was a very good outcome. That the immunological markers of stress and cortisol levels were significantly decreased after these exercises. So, what this entails is literally laughing. Okay, so I hope that you'll do it with me so I don't have to be embarrassed up here and laugh all by myself. So, you just laugh, you just go, ah! <laughs> 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 Yes, it's true. Why does healing have to be like this very serious moment? You know, meditation is all very serious, you know, so uh, lightening up and getting more oxygen to the brain and teaching people to laugh and enjoy the moments that you can. So uh, I hope this was helpful to all of you and you learned something. And, and please feel free to connect with me uh, just to ask questions or to get more resources and information. And I'm happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Is there anything that would, so would there be any reason somebody shouldn't have acupuncture? Yeah, I mean, look, there Other are. Other than, like, you were saying, like, yeah, 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 I mean, there are reasons, but if you're going to someone experienced, I don't think it's an issue. Some of the issues that it would be a problem for has to do with um, blood clotting factors. Um, and, you know, and, and if your immune system, if your blood cell count was super low, if you were in a situation in the hospital where you, you know, um, had to be quarantined because your immunity was not so good. Yeah. Those are. Those are I have one question. I'm, I'm one of those people. I, I, I can probably look at the picture yeah. of the needle yeah. <laughs> that you're talking about. Yeah, totally. But I'm really interested in it and some of the healthy pressure stuff. But I think one of the reasons I've always hesitated to do it uh -huh. on myself. Um, it, I guess I'm worried that I would hit something that would be bad. Is there uh -huh. any risk of like. With acupressure? Yes. Yeah. No, there's no risk, but acupressure is really no different than perhaps getting a massage. I mean, certainly you wouldn't want to do it in your, what's called your carotid. Right. 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 That's like actually, you know, in martial arts, when they would you ever see those movies where they go off like right. that, and the person passes out. Right. Because like, of this point here, right? Yeah. So other than that, no. I mean, unless you're on like, you know, elderly people sometimes or patients who are on blood thinners, you could get excessive bruising, I suppose, but... I think acupressure is very benign and helpful. Okay. Yeah, other than question, that, there's not like a spot in my ear that I'm going to put in. No. No, I don't think so. Okay. It's pretty safe overall. Uh -huh. Can you, can a person become immune to acupuncture, acu, yeah, acupuncture after doing it in the same spot or over the course of time? So that's a really interesting question. Um, sometimes people come in for their first treatment and they have this amazing experience and then after that they're like, I didn't feel anything. Why has it changed? I had a good feeling, now that feeling's gone. 
Um, so that has to, so really it's not about that you're becoming immune to it, but um, when we give acupuncture, we're looking at patterns of imbalance in the body and generally you're not having the exact same points every time because I'm not putting in a needle. Certainly I'm teaching you things like this point is for nausea, but when I'm giving acupuncture, I'm um, making an entire Chinese medical diagnosis that's based on a pattern of imbalance. So if I'm doing that correctly, then you wouldn't become immune to it. Yeah, that makes sense? Thank you very much. Uh, there's no requirement that I sort of feel your ties. So there's similarities that are that are there with because uh, different parts of the world generate ways of dealing with life. Vicissitudes mm -hmm. the, there's gonna be common common denominators. Um, when one thinks of mindfulness, I think that one can apply it to eating. Uh, we eat for nutrition because it's essential. And uh, we for pleasure. Most of the other reasons are filling emptiness and doing things that are probably not in our best interest. Uh, being very much aware of, uh, of what we eat and how we eat uh, is important. And then the question becomes does it change when uh, we have certain conditions? And we're very fortunate to. And Kelly Isaacson with us this morning is uh, uh, a true nutritional uh, uh, expert and particularly in inflammatory bowel disease where uh, from a personal point of view when uh, we round out inpatients who are always more complicated than one could imagine, uh, Kelly is, uh, is there and she can assist them at that's outpatient consultation. Uh, probably uh, among a very small handful of uh, true experts in inflammatory bowel disease nutrition. Kelly, Thank you, Dr. Feldman, for that warm introduction, and thank you all for being here today and um, allowing me to speak on a topic that um, I uh, find very important for health. Um, I'm going to speak about nutrition for wellness in general. I usually speak about specific diets for IBD, but today I'm going back to the basics. Um, so just to give you a little bit of, uh, of information about me, I'm a clinical dietitian and I've been working here at Cedar Sinai for over nine years. And a lot of my patients, um, or a lot of people, actually don't know what the difference is between a dietitian and a nutritionist. Um, so I just wanted to um, lay that out uh, before we get into the talk. So a dietitian um, um, has to have certain uh, level of education. We all have, at minimum, a bachelor's degree. We've completed a dietetic internship of over 1,100 uh, clinical hours. Um, we have all passed the national exam to become registered, and we must maintain continuing education hours. Um, and some of us, like me, have master's degrees and additional certifications. And a nutritionist um, does not, there's no um, real definition for that. There's no standardization. So anybody can call themselves a nutritionist. So if you want to learn more about nutrition for IBD, 
or any specific condition, it's important that you seek out a qualified individual. And as Dr. Feldman said, I do specialize in IBD and GI nutrition. Um, I run with the inpatient team here at Sears, and I also work in the IBD clinic, and I see patients in my own outpatient clinic here at Sears. And so here are the objectives for today. Um, today, I just want to, um, I hope you take away these two main points. So number one is to understand what your nutrient needs are with respect to IBD. And number two is to describe at least one lifestyle modification um, that will promote health and wellness. So macronutrients, let's start there. So these are nutrients that you need in large amounts. And there are three main types. Some people say four, if you want to include water. Um, but they include carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And these are all essential for health. And so I um, did this pyramid here just to kind of visualize um, uh, how much you need in, in terms of um, each of the <laughs> macronutrients. You really need more carbohydrates than the other macronutrients. Um, fats and proteins uh, are kind of equal, um, but the most of our nutrition should come from carbohydrates. Um, as I said, these are our body's main sources of energy. Um, and our brain's preferred fuel source. And carbohydrates come from foods, um, from plants, um, such as fruits, vegetables, grains, milk, beans, and sweetened foods. Fats are important sources of calories. They help our body to um, use vitamins, and they also help us to produce hormones. Um, so they are essential for health. And they come in two main types, saturated and unsaturated. And the saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature. And those come mainly from animal sources, like lard and butter. Um, and also, they come from tropical plants, such as coconut and palm. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. And these are going to be mostly plant-based, so olive oil, um, you know, walnut oil, avocado oil, these are going to be your unsaturated fats. And um, protein is needed for growth, repair, and healing. Um, and there are vegetarian protein sources as well as animal protein sources. It is possible to be a vegan and get everything you need. Um, some people um, uh, do that very well. Um, you need more protein if you're in a flare or if you've had recent surgery. So um, that would be part of our session um, discussion. If you're coming to see me, um, you know, ways to increase your protein if you're on certain medications or in a flare or have had resistance. So uh, we're going to talk about the main macronutrients um, a little bit in detail, and then we'll go into the micronutrients. So when you're looking at carbohydrates, try to choose minimally processed if you can. Um, and what that means is just, you know, the food in, in, in as whole form as possible. So if you can choose whole grains, such as wheat bread, brown rice, and snow cut oats, um, that those are going to be um, foods that are going to have more of the nutrients, uh, because when we process foods, um, the nutrients are mostly stripped away. Fresh fruit, um, beans, and plain yogurt. Um, but it's important to know if you have strict strain disease or if you had recent surgery, you might need to limit fiber. A lot of my patients are surprised to find out that they don't have to avoid fiber for their the rest of their life. You know, they go into the hospital um, with a flare, they have sur surgery, and they're discharged on a low fiber diet, and they're never really told or instructed how to um, reintroduce fiber into their diet. So uh, that's part of what I focus on in my sessions. Um, but of course, diet is very individualized and not everyone can tolerate a lot of fiber in their diet. So um, it's best to listen to your own body and um, eat foods um, as you tolerate. Um, when you're looking at carbohydrates to limit, you want to limit those that are high in added sugars, um, such as sweets or candy. Um, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking at a food label, um, you want to limit your added sugar to less than 30 grams a day. And I don't know if anybody's seen the recent nutrition labels, but they've um, gone through um, an update recently and now include added sugar on the, um, on the label. So that can help us to um, make better food choices when we're comparing products. 
Um, you also want to limit things like juice and soda. Um, concentrated sweets can not only increase GI symptoms, um, but they can add added um, calories to your diet that aren't exactly nutrient dense. Um, in terms of protein, again, you want to choose minimally processed proteins when you can. Uh, plant based proteins include beans, lentils, nuts, seeds like hemp and chia, tofu, seitan, which is a wheat meat, and um, grains like quinoa. Um, animal proteins, good choices are going to come from meats <coughs> like poultry, uh, breast, bean beef, or grass fed beef. Even if the grass fed beef is a higher fat content, it's going to have a better ratio of omega 6, um, sorry, of omega 3 to omega 6 fatty acids. Um, the omega 6 fatty acids are more pro inflammatory, and the omega 3 fatty acids are more anti inflammatory. And we see higher ratios of omega 3 fatty acids in grass fed beef. Um, eggs and fish and seafood are also good um, animal proteins to choose. And you want to limit the highly processed or fatty meats, such as sausage, bacon, bologna, ham, um, you know, canned meats. Um, these aren't great for our health. They contribute to um, you know, heart disease. And um, they can be high in sodium and um, possibly increase your risk for colon cancer. Fatty ground beef and fatty cuts of meat or meat with lots of marbling, um, you want to avoid or limit as well. That's not to say that you can never have these foods, it's just try to um, not have them on a regular uh, basis. And in terms of fats, you want to look for mostly plant oils. Olive oil is great for cold applications. I don't really use that when I'm baking or when I'm sauteing, just because it is prone to break down really easily. It has a low smoke point. Um, so for the more hot applications, I use grapeseed or avocado oils. Um, and then nuts, seeds, and avocado are also really great fats, um, great for, for reducing your cholesterol, great source of soluble fiber. And if you do need to limit fiber, you can um, do nut butters, like a creamy nut butter or um, seed butter. And then you want to try and limit or avoid animal fats, such as butter, lard, and animal skin. Um, and hydrogenated oils are probably one of the worst oils we can eat because not only do they increase our bad cholesterol, they lower our good cholesterol, our HDL. Um, so if you're looking at the ingredients label and it says that an oil is hydrogenated, um, you'll see like um, palm oil that's hydrogenated, um, you really want to stay away from that product. Coconut and palm oils. Coconut oil um, is cited in the, in the media as a healthy oil. Um, we're not sure how the saturated fat um, in coconut oil affects our heart or if it has a beneficial effect. But to give you an idea of the saturated fat content of coconut oil, it's higher than butter. So if you're going to um, have coconut oil, it's okay to have it in moderation. I wouldn't make it your everyday um, oil that you're using in your foods. And I don't expect you to remember you know, everything, but a tool that can really help you when you're grocery shopping or you're in the store is the nutrition facts label. And what you're looking for here is the serving size. You first want to look at the serving size because um, that's going to tell you everything that's in that product per serving. And if the product has more than one serving in the container and you eat the whole container, you just need to multiply that to see what you're getting. Um, <clears throat> And then, um, as I said, the food label now uh, shows added sugars on the label. This one um, is a bad example. It does not have that, but you will start seeing that more in the, in the grocery stores. And the ingredients label is another thing that's really helpful to look at just to see what's in that product. As a rule, I try not to buy any um, food products that list ingredients that I wouldn't normally stock in my kitchen. I mean, some things like alpha tocopherol, which is you know vitamin E, is fine to have in your product. But things like maltodextrin or xanthan gum or hydrogenated oils, um, they're not great for our health to consume on a regular basis. Studies show that they can alter our microbiota and even lead to a weakened intestinal uh, barrier. So. Um, 
if you have those products, just try to limit them. Um, but just be mindful when you are looking at products that uh, maybe that can help you in terms of comparing um, and, um, different food items and seeing which one would be better for you to choose. Um, and then I just wanted to you know, say that a lot of things can be listed as organic and healthy and natural and not actually be good for you. Um, a big hype right now is gluten-free. Most people are gluten-free, but that doesn't mean that that product is good for you. Some people do feel better when they cut out gluten, and some people don't really notice an effect. Um, but just because you have a certain GI condition doesn't mean you absolutely have to be gluten-free. Um, and then things like cookies can be organic, but this particular product has palm, hydrogenated palm oil in it. So um, organic does not mean healthy. Um, you do not need to eat certain foods or uh, do certain juice cleanses to cleanse your organs. Your organs do that naturally your liver, your kidneys, and your lungs naturally um, cleanse and manage the pH of your body, and you don't need to buy any special food product or regimen to do that. This is also something I found when I was um, just Googling like healthy diet, um, organic detox with apple cider vinegar, and they recommend that you drink half a bottle of this apple cider vinegar in the morning and at night which is not something I would ever recommend. That can ruin your enamel, that can uh, delay gastric emptying and cause nausea and vomiting, and that can um, um, also see, yes, have a bottle in the morning at night. So that's, that's quite a lot of apple cider vinegar, and that would not make you feel great. Um, and this is a, a sample of a three-day uh, diet detox, which is I don't see any sort of uh, source of protein here. Um, I do see ch ch maybe these are chia seeds. That would be a little bit of protein there. But basically, this is a protein-free, uh, very low-calorie um, diet that I would not recommend. Um, your body would basically be um, starving itself and breaking down its own stores for nutrients. <laughs> and this is um, an example of some products from a health website uh, advertising coconut oil and um, certified raw, which is not a real thing, and certified clean, which is also not a real um, thing. So there are just <laughs> tricks that manufacturers use to try and um, deceive us into thinking that we are doing something good for our bodies. Um, so um, what I typically recommend and what I try to follow is a Mediterranean diet. Um, this diet has been um, promoted to as a natural, non-pharmacological, nutraceutical um, way for um, promoting healthy aging and has been linked to reduce Parkinson's risk, reduce colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer risk reduce cardiovascular disease risk and is protective against depression. Um, and it consists of a very simple um, diet. It's mostly plant-based. It's high in fruits and vegetables. And the um, fat that's used is primarily olive oil. Some fish and meat and cheese and yogurt is allowed, mainly as a way to um, in, um, enhance flavors um, of your meat. Maybe a little bit of diced beef on your, um, you know, rice pilaf with um, cooked veggies, but meat is not the main um, portion or part of this um, diet. And of course, alcohol in moderation. Um, in terms of micronutrients, these are needed in small amounts. Um, these do not provide energy like our carbs, fats, and proteins. Uh, they're needed in our body mainly for um, chemical reactions to take place. Um, and vitamins are broken down into water-soluble and fat-soluble. So for water-soluble, we have the B vitamins, um, such as folate, B12, thiamine, pyridoxine, and then we have um, vitamin C. And then D, E, K, and A, those are our fat-soluble vitamins. Um, and then for minerals, there are two main types. We have micro, uh, macro minerals and then micro minerals. So we need a little higher amounts of these and um, much smaller amounts of these. So these are like 
milligram amounts, and these are like microgram amounts, very tiny. Mm -hmm. um, potassium, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium are examples there, and then zinc, copper, fluoride, cobalt, chromium, and selenium. And these again are essential for health. Our bodies cannot make these. Um, in terms of common deficiencies for IBD, the most common are going to be iron, vitamin D, and B6. Um, about, I think, a little more than 45% of people with IBD are iron deficient. Um, this is very common, especially in active disease, and this can lead to overall poor quality of life. You feel fatigued, you feel nauseous, you feel short of breath, you can't go to work, you can't um, exercise, just makes you overall feel not great. Um, Vitamin D deficiency is also common in IBD. I see in my clinical practice about two thirds of my patients are vitamin D deficient, either because they're not able to absorb it well, or they're not, um, um, you know, uh, supplementing with it. It's really hard to get enough vitamin D in the diet. Um, to give you an example, uh, most most of my patients need around five thousand units a day. Um, that's going to vary, so definitely talk to your doctor before um, you start supplementing if you're considering that. But um, a serving of fatty fish gives you about 400 IUs of vitamin D a day. So you would have to eat a lot of fatty fish to get um, enough vitamin D. Um, if you're vitamin D deficient, it's very easy to correct. You can talk to your doctor about that, and that can help to protect your health of uh, your bones. Um, vitamin B6 is also known as pyridoxine, and if you're not eating a lot or if you're on a really restrictive diet, um, you can be deficient, and this can increase your risk for blood clots. Others that I see commonly in my practice and in the literature are um, low B12, zinc, and selenium. B12 can be low if you're vegetarian, um, if your body's not producing enough, if your stomach isn't producing enough uh, stomach acid. Um, or if you've had surgery or active disease of your ileum. Um, zinc can be low if you have um, diarrhea or if you're on a vegetarian diet or if you've had a lot of weight loss. Um, and then selenium can be low if you're on a, a really restrictive diet or if you've lost weight recently. If you think you might be deficient or if you're concerned about your nutrition status of any of these nutrients, talk to your doctor before supplementing. Um, and we can easily, um, you know, check your nutrition labs and see where you are and if you need additional supplementation. Studies show that vitamins and mineral supplementation isn't beneficial unless you have a documented deficiency. So um, you can also ask your doctor for a referral to a registered dietitian who can do a um, diet history and uh, examine your surgical and medical history and see if you need to take additional supplementation. And then to end, um, these are some additional lifestyle modifications for wellness. So um, what I encourage in a lot of uh, my patients and in myself is to remember to uh, deep, uh, breathe deeply to activate your rest and digest mode. Um, a lot of us are very stressed or um, on time crunches. We have many things to do throughout the day. And some of us are eating, you know, on our um, uh, on our lunch break, but also working. So just remembering to take the time for yourself to, um, you know, uh, digest your food will really help. Um, our last speaker spoke a little bit about that brain gut access. And if we're stressed, if we're constantly on um, in a hyper mode, then we're um, diverting blood away from our gut and we're not allowing ourselves to digest our foods well. And that's going to make us not feel great after eating. So what I recommend is just taking a couple of deep breaths right before you take that first bite, getting into a rest and digest mode, and that should help with your um, digestion throughout your meal. Stay active if you can. Doesn't mean you have to go run a marathon. Just going outside and walking is so great for your health. And remember, your gut is a muscle, so going out and walking um, can help with constipation as well as um, uh, energy and mood balance. And again, try to eat a balanced uh, meal. Home-cooked meals are best. You don't have to do anything fancy. Just cooking at home is going to be a really great um, thing for your health. And chew foods well and eat slowly. I have to remind myself of that, too. And I'm just going to close on one of my favorite quotes 
um, eat food, not too much, and eat mostly plants. So eat real food, not try to minimize that processed food. You don't eat too much because that's not going to make you feel great. And try to focus mostly on plant foods. Here's my contact information. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer any of those for you. And um, uh, there's my Twitter handle if you are on Twitter. Any questions for today? Are all these dietary suggestions applicable to those with ostomies as well, or is there a different set of rules? Yeah, so <clears throat> a lot of my patients who have ostomies can go back to a normal diet. Um, I think the key there is to have smaller, more frequent meals, but most of them can eat um, you know, regular foods like they did before. Uh, is there something you talked to my daughter about, um, about hydration? Yeah, it's a great question. So rehydration solutions. Um, my question was about fluids. And a lot of the times if you have diarrhea or an ostomy or you're in a flare and you're losing a lot of um, fluids, you're losing electrolytes. Yes. And drinking water isn't going to be enough to replace those electrolytes. Um, so um, the World Health Organization, you can Google World Health Organization ORS, and that'll give you a, a recipe for a rehydration solution. I can give it to you now too. It's four cups of water, um, a half teaspoon of salt, and six teaspoons of sugar, and you just mix that up, and that makes a liter or a quart of rehydration solution. And you just sip on that throughout the day, and that's going to really help to rehydrate you. Um, you can also drink something like Pedialyte, or take Gatorade and dilute it with water and add a little bit of salt, um, because you need the right ratio of water, sugar, and salt to rehydrate yourself. And real sugar instead of sugar substitutes? Yeah, you do need um, real sugar. A little bit of glucose will um, uh, enhance that sugar, uh, sorry, that water absorption. Can you give me a again? Four, Four, cups. Okay. Four cups of water, yeah. half a teaspoon of salt, and six teaspoons of sugar. And there's also, um, I've already said products, but I, if you have more um, questions about that, I can give you some more um, tips on that afterwards. Put all oils great. It's a vegetable oil. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where do you sit in terms of gluten being an inflammatory agent in the body? Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you look at the literature, um, some the studies are conflicting. So some studies show that it can increase um, inflammation in the intestines, and other studies aren't really showing that. Um, I do find that when my patients are using diet to help reduce inflammation, a gluten-free diet isn't going to be enough to do that. It does help my patients feel better um, some of the times, um, but it doesn't necessarily reduce intestinal inflammation. Yes. Um, talking about reducing inflammation, I read a lot about different, I don't know if they're fads or not, but using turmeric or collagen and eating those things. How do you know what's really real or studied? And do you have any suggestions of other things to be taking that could reduce inflammation? Um, so there is evidence showing that turmeric can help to decrease inflammation in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. Um, and some studies showing that it can also reduce inflammation in Crohn's. Um, <clears throat> that is something that I think is great to bring up to your physician and see if that's a, something that you can incorporate into your IBD management plan um, because it's not for everyone and it does come with risks and there is a specific dose that you need to take. And there are things that we can monitor to see if you're responding to that. So, um, turmeric is um, one proposed um, supplement to help reduce inflammation. Collagen is not a um, complete protein, and when you eat it, you break it down into the amino acids, and then you use it, you know, however your body needs it. It doesn't really, you know, we don't see that it really affects inflammation. Yes? What about 
about like some of these diets, like the low fat diet. I tried it; it's kind of hard to follow. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the low FODMAP diet, we do see in studies that it helps to reduce um, functional symptoms in IBD. It does not reduce inflammation. So it can help you feel better if you don't have um, active inflammation. That's where we kind of implement it. And then there's a recent um, conference that just happened in, and they reported uh, research showing that it can help to reduce fecal incontinence. So it can help with abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloating, gas, and doesn't really help with constipation and it's not going to reduce inflammation. And low fiber is hard to do. So it's like on your um, pyramid, uh -huh. it's more, it sees more protein based. You know, it's, it's harder to get the carbohydrates that are for you. Yeah, yeah, so it, it would, um, you know, you can have gluten-free grains, you can have rice and things like that. Um, um, yeah, but it is harder to follow, and it's only a short-term diet. I do have some patients who come to me who have been on low FODMAP for years, and that's just, you know, overly restrictive, and I feel awful that no one ever told them, you know, that they didn't, that wasn't necessary for that long. So, uh, but it can help our patients. How about small treatment Um, that definitely makes a difference. So small frequent meals versus one huge meal. Um, your body is just going to tolerate smaller portions better throughout the day, especially if you have symptoms of nausea, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, um, if you have diarrhea. Um, you're going to break down and utilize those nutrients better if you have them in smaller portions more often throughout the day. That big meal bolus is going to uh, put a lot of strain on your body, um, and it's also not great for you know blood sugar control or energy. Um, you know, um, so try to break down your meals, especially if you're feeling a little more symptomatic. That's really going to help you to feel a lot better. Those small, simple changes make a huge difference. You know, it's. A lot of times it's not, you know, low FODMAP or gluten free or SCD or any of these restrictive diets. It's just how fast are you eating? How often are you eating? Are you taking your time when you eat? And those simple changes can really make a difference in how you're feeling. I don't do any grains at all, um, gluten free or otherwise. So, how do I get carbo enough carbohydrates in my daily diet without? Okay, that's a great question. So on a grain-free diet, how do you get adequate carbs? Um, I have a lot of patients on grain-free diets, and um, carbohydrates, let's go back to that slide, include, so not just grains, but they also come from plants, uh, fruits, vegetables, um, milk, beans, and sweetened foods. So if you're having like lentils or black beans or kidney beans, okay, kind of dairy or sugar. So. <laughs> Fruit yeah. and vegetables okay. are going to be um, your um, a primary carbohydrate source. So try to make sure you're getting those every time you eat. Your, your brain needs at minimum 100 grams of carbohydrates a day for proper functioning. Um, and you know, I, I don't know about your history or what you've tried or who you've worked with, but um, if you, meeting with a dietitian can help you to identify foods that maybe you can bring back into your diet. Um, that, that's what our job is, to help you, um, you know, trial foods and see which ones work for you and don't. Um, most of my patients are able to successfully reintroduce foods into their diet and feel good. So, um, if you're struggling or if you feel really restricted on your diet, definitely see a dietitian and we can help you. So for carbs, what do you think of the keto diet in general? So that's a great question and very topical. Um, keto has not been shown to reduce inflammation in GI conditions. What we do use it for in the medical community is, um, or in the medical setting, is um, uh, seizures. So we use it a lot in, in people who have epilepsy, and that is the only clinical indication for a keto diet. 
other than that, that really high protein load can put a strain um, on your kidneys and not getting enough carbs isn't great for brain um, function. All right. I just want to make one uh, point of uh, it's very preliminary research, but very solid research that uh, uh, that the pituitary, sort of the master control center of the brain, uh, needs sugar in order to turn off appetite appropriate way, and when it sees uh, pseudo sugars as the, the, the first uh, the sweeteners that are not, not uh, caloric sweeteners, uh, the common question is why don't I lose so much weight? I've been you know, diet sodas all the time. The answer is that the pituitary may say, I don't see the real sugar, and so your appetite may actually be increased. Tricky, tricky field that we're in, and uh, 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 we not only have an unbelievable lack of knowledge in something that is so common and so everyday and everybody depends on it in life, but then we have greed from industry that throws us all this nonsense and uh, you feel bad you don't take three multiple vitamins a day. You know, my God. I'm missing something. So it's a, it's a difficult, difficult area, and it's one in which we ought to be very, very thoughtful and very virtuous. Uh, not only what you present, but what you do. Thank you. We're going to take a 10 minute break. There's uh, uh, snackers uh, uh, back here that uh, the organization has provided. There are restrooms that way and that way. And we'll come back to the program.
I'm going to ask you if you could just make your seat so we can continue. So I'm going to get started, even if you're not ready. Um, the uh, uh, the next uh, 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 I'm going to say module, but the the, the next uh, approach uh, that one uh, can use is uh, uh, personally dear to my heart, as I'm a, a practitioner of uh, Iyengar Yoga for the last 20 years, so I'm, I'm very familiar with. Uh, with much that it has to offer and much that it has to, to do with uh, mindfulness through pranayama practice, etc. But we're fortunate today to uh, to have uh, uh, Olivia Berry, who's not only a physical therapist but a uh, very experienced teacher of yoga, and uh, uh, one can again consider. Uh, each of these separately, or I look again to you to think about the fact that the common threads that you might see as we listen to these different approaches. Good afternoon. Now it's all right. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Olivia, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I have been teaching yoga for over 15 years, and um, It's an ancient tradition, so this some say it's over 5,000 years old. And so it developed initially for uh, holy people in India, holy men, really, to be practicing yoga as a spiritual practice. But as it's come across the West, it's uh, if you haven't done yoga in LA, which in LA, <laughs> We've all, most people in this room have done some yoga. Um, but it's, it's mostly a physical practice here now. And the beautiful thing I have to say about the transition is that yoga is just helpful for so many things. Almost any way is practiced. That's what I've discovered having studied so many different traditions. And really, that's inclusive of mindfulness. But specifically for digestion, of course, it's useful to move and not just sit and meditate. But both are have their benefits. And we're going to do some practice today in the chair. So we do some practice um, that will include some movement. So if you just have a big snap, it'll be okay, actually. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits of yoga on the physical level. So. There is a strength component to the yoga poses. And that might, it might seem like, well, of course, because it's physical. But there are many yoga poses that also are more passive and supported by props. Even the chair, you can consider a prop. So you don't have to stand, you can sit on the chair. But many poses also orient towards strength, which provides us not just brute strength, brute force, but strength within a certain structure, and ideally strength that leads to optimal alignment in the body. And when we get our spines aligned, sure, our neck and shoulders and lower backs feel better, but the lower back, of course, is the front of, is the back of the gut. And so what's supporting your gut behind you makes a difference in how you're feeling and uh, operating in that area. Restoring. So yoga will benefit it increases circulation everywhere, but including throughout the digestive tract. So many of the, when we sequence a yoga sequence, you know, some of today, we use the four movements of the spine. So the forward bending, which will compress on the intestinal region, the whole digestive tract, and then backward bending, which opens it up. And so just this motion here of compressing, releasing, compressing, releasing. You can imagine like a sponge, show that sponge that you're squeezing, releasing, squeezing, releasing. And it's like peristalsis, of course, the movement 
of food through the digestive tract. So the movements enhance the natural processes of the body. So it's not like the movements fix you, but they enhance that which is already occurring in us, ideally in an optimal way. So what if you don't need more peristalsis? Maybe there's too much of that going on. You avoid those poses, and you might take another pose where you're more quiet, not moving as much. There's also side bending, hopefully the core movements of the spine, and rotation. And so all of these have a unique way of touching into the lower belly. If you think of kids crawling around, running around, I just gave birth to a little four month old, constantly moving his arms and legs everywhere, and everything everywhere. And then we get older and we get very sedentary. And we don't have to be that way, right? And even you'll know, see, I'll watch people just in regular classes, gym classes, and they're kind of in just their normal posture than doing the weights. And so what's unique about yoga is it sort of pulls you out of your normal. And so you actually come back more into a kid-like posture, upright like this, and then add the movements, opposed to the normal posture, and then adding the movements. So there's this extra little benefit of yoga. You might think, well, I do exercise, I work out. But there's this extra alignment-oriented approach that helps everything move more easily through your digestive tract. Um, which brings us to toning. So toning is a balancing, regulating, meaning if there's too much motility, there are poses that can slow that down. If things are stagnant, as I mentioned, there are poses that can help speed things up. And the cleansing, facilitating waste removal, is that sponge-like action. And so you'll feel this. Yoga, sometimes it's said, is 99% uh, practice and 1% theory. So right now I'm chatting away. Hopefully it's just about 1% and the 99% will do. It won't be that ratio, but we're going to be doing some movement to it so you can feel what I'm saying. Yoga relieves stress, which reduces flares, right? So yoga does calm the mind. How does it do that? We learn to observe our mental chatter rather than identify with it. <coughs> so the brain has its worries and its things that go on and on and on. And we're going about our day, and then there's this chatter, this noise. There's noise outside of us, and there's noise inside of us. But you'll see when you focus on the body, move this way, align that way, that the brain starts to settle and starts to focus, eventually becoming like laser pointed, like this little dot here, right? So our brain goes, like, uh, and then we end up being still, stable, laser pointed focus. And that makes the whole body calm down. Because all of those cares and worries that we're storing in our shoulders or in our gut or in our glutes start to wash away. Do they come back? They come back. That's why we practice yoga. It's not just a one-time stop. You have to keep doing it. Yoga teaches equanimity. We discover how to steady our emotions. How is that possible? So it's not to get rid of our emotions, it's to steady them. So we, again, observe, oh, I'm feeling really happy, I'm feeling really excited, oh, I'm feeling really sad, but not, I'm a happy person all the time, I'm a sad person all the time. Oh, I feel depressed, I'm just a depressed person. It's not that so much you are that person, it's you might be feeling those emotions. And the sense of I am, period is what we take with us as more a sense of being a state. Not, oh, I'm like this, I'm like that. We're all, all so many things. <coughs> and when we when we can reduce it down again, simplify some of the clutter, we feel calmer. And we feel more at ease, at home in ourselves. And then ideally yoga is fun too. And fun always helps with relaxing, relaxation. Okay, let's begin. So, what I would suggest is scoot your chair back a little bit away from the table, but then scoot yourself forward so you're sitting about in the middle of the chair. So there's not a tendency to lean back in it. Place your feet hip distance apart on the floor. Ankles on your knees. And put your hands on your thighs. Feel your feet on the earth. 
ground knee to steady in there. And take a deep breath in through your nose. And then part the lips open. Exhale out. Two more times like that. Inhale through the nose. Soft shoulders. Exhale out the mouth. And last time. Deep breath in. Tall spine. Exhale, releasing the air, keeping the spine tall. Now, make your way over the table. Let's see if you can reach your arms forward. Palm space in. And then lift up. This is deceptively difficult, I would say, after a few minutes, I notice. So if you're just feeling that, I want you to know you're not alone. Lifting the arms up, the heart has to pump the blood all the way up there. But what's nice about the challenge in the arms is it teaches the spine what to do. So let your spine be like your arms. So from the tailbone up through the crown of the head, be tall, including the side waist right along here, lift up. Now, are you holding the breath? Breathe. How? You can just breathe in and out through the nose if that's comfortable for you. Stay tall in the arms. Guys look great. Soft in the upper trapezius muscles, right at the base of the neck. Soft in the jaw. What about the belly? What to do with it? A gentle drawing back and up. Not, ooh, like 100 sit-ups. Gentle drawing back and up. Just some hugging towards your lower spine. One more in-breath. When you exhale, release the hands. Very good. You guys done this before. All right, this is that compressing. So I'm going to let you choose how much you do. If you're having a day where everything's moving through too quickly, you're not going to do as intensely. You can still do the movement though. Hands on thighs. So we're going to start with the back bend. So you release the abdomen. Inhale, lift your chest, glance up. And then exhale, pull the lower navel back, glance down. We'll rock on the sit bones, forward and back. Inhale, rocking forward on the sit bones. So body points, lift your chest. Exhale, draw the abdomen back, rock back on the body points. You're letting the pelvis roll around on the sit bones. Inhale, forward. You can use the arms a little to pull the chest forward and up. Exhale, a little bit of squeezing in the abdominal muscles, contracting. Inhale, release the abdominals. Squeeze the back muscles a little to raise the chest. Very nice. Exhale. Pull back. A few more at your own pace. So let your breath, your own breath, dictate the speed of movement for you. It may not be the same pace as the person next to you. You can close your eyes if you like to go a little more internal. You can keep your eyes open, but still be aware of the inner, the inner experience. And one more time, inhaling. One more time, exhaling. And then just come somewhere in the middle. So you're right on the tops of the sit bones. Draw the shoulders gently back. Some lift the chest. So it's a more sustainable posture, not quite as extreme as this one. Not quite as slouched as the next one. Okay. All right, from there, we're going to take a little chair twist. So she doesn't have these sidebars that you have. You're going to use the sidebar. So taking your left hand to your right leg, put your right hand on the right armrest. Right hand on the right armrest. Face you. All right, so this is a twist. Now twisting starts to do a gentle wringing out of the abdominal organs. It's gentle. The lower back, though, we want to be sensitive to its health. And what we need for lower back health and twisting is height. So inhale, lift the chest. Lift the side ribs. Exhale, twist, turn a little bit more. You can use your arms on the armrest and your left hand on your right leg. Inhale, get tall through the spine to the sides of the waist. Exhale, turn a little more. You can also use your abdominal muscles, turning from left to right. Inhale through the crown of the head, like you have a little string up there, lifting you towards the ceiling. Exhale, stay in the twist. Just soften the tops of the shoulders. Release any tension there. That's right. Inhale, tall, tall chest. Soft jaw. Turn a little bit more, maybe. Or just stay where you're at and just be there and breathe. Three more breaths here. And on your third exhale, slowly unwind. Stay tall. 
but unwind back to the center. Just notice how you feel. Sometimes we can't really feel what twists in until they're over. Like, oh yeah. And second side. So starting with the breath in, small chest. Exhale, turn to your left. Taking the right hand to the left leg. Inhale, from the two sit bones grounded evenly, lift the chest. And exhale, turn maybe a little more. Using your left hand on the armrest, your right hand on your left leg. Side ribs tall. Inhale, up the side, lungs even. Uh -huh. And when you exhale, soften the tops of the shoulders. So there's height to the rib cage, but those muscles at the base of the neck a little less tense, a little less shrugged. Inhale, where is the fun in this? Can you find some levity? Exhale, turn. Inhale, with the abdominal muscles this time, when you exhale, turn the belly from right to left, a little ringing out thick. And then one more inhale. And when you exhale, you'll unwind and come back to the center. Maybe feeling a little more balanced this time after doing both sides. Okay, a side bend. So let's start. So the thing she's doing. So lift your left arm up. The right hand can be on the chair. Take a breath in, get tall on the left, and exhale, bend. You can also put your right elbow on the armrest. That might be a little bit more accessible there. All right, so this one we're just going to hold. Notice where you feel the sensation of stretch. Some of you might be very bendy and feel nothing. That's possible. Then you might want to go further. You can reach your right hand down the leg of the chair. Otherwise, maybe it's in the waist on the left, maybe the shoulder blade area. Sometimes even in the left buttock, you might feel something. If you have a shoulder injury, you might not want to lift your arm. You can just keep your elbow by your left waist and bring your hand to your shoulder and bend like that. Now the lower belly, again, just a soft drawing in. Not a hard drawing in, not nothing, just reaching out. Like 20% effort, just a little hugging to your lower spine. And coming up, lower your left arm. Raise your right arm and you inhale. And exhale, bend to the left. Now on this side, you may feel Stretch in the same place. But on the right side, you might feel it in a different place. And as your brain explores, where am I feeling this? That's mindfulness. That's why I'm probing you with these questions. So you really tune into the sensations as opposed to like, oh yeah, I'm in this stretch, but I'm going to think about what I'm going to have for dinner tonight or you know whatever it is where do I feel this what does that feel like how does it feel as I'm here breath after breath am I getting tighter maybe am I letting go more maybe so without judgment observing your experience am I holding my breath maybe maybe I'll take a deeper breath in now. yeah Coming back to this home position, which is sitting tall, as opposed to our regular slouch. I do it too. Sitting tall, breathing, observing how things are changing. The feeling of circulation. When you bend and then come back, the body has a surge of blood flow, which brings healing to areas. All right, we don't have so much space to do this with the legs. We're going to do another side bend. Just take your legs a tiny bit apart, your knees a tiny bit apart. And we'll go with the uh, your right arm down. Lift your left arm up, inhale. And then exhale, slide your right arm down the inside of your right leg. That's it. And press a little your right arm against your right leg. And reach the left arm up and over. And release the tops of the shoulders away from the ears. Gentle hug of the lower belly in. The purpose of that is just as I said, the muscles to come in towards the lower back so that your lower back has some support. But we don't want to get frozen in our lower abdomen. Like diaphragmatic breathing, when you inhale, there's a gentle swell in the lower belly. 
And when you exhale, there's a gentle receding in the lower belly. Lower your left arm, lift your right arm, inhale. Slide the left arm as you exhale down the inside of the left leg, bend to your left. You guys sit down, I'm gonna stand up. So your diaphragm is here, it's the main muscle of respiration. So as you inhale, it goes down, the lower belly can slightly move. Even though you're holding it in, it's not the stuck. When you exhale, it moves back. With the belly breathing, even with a gentle hold. So that as we move through our days, we have circulation and breath through our gut and support for our lower back. It's the two things also important in these stretches. Inhale, come up. Lower your hands. Bring your feet at distance again. Exhale, feel your feet on the floor. All right, I was saying you get to sit the whole time, but there is one scanning one. Why is this one important? Why am I making it up? It's because here, if we bring the thigh against the ascending colon, the thigh against the descending colon, this is one that even as you translate the names of these poses from Sanskrit to English, there's one you do it on your back, which we're not going to hear, and it's actually called wind relieving pose. So this is like from the 5,000 years ago. They even were like, oh yeah, this one helps the back. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it on the chair. So you'll just watch for a moment. You're going to stand up. Instead of sideways, we'll go forward because you guys don't have space to your sides. And then you can just bring, there's options, you bring your hands here, you bring your hands here, and the more flexible you are, the hands can go down towards the floor. Okay, so let's stand up, turn around, face your chair, and let's all start with the right foot on the chair. And then you're gonna bring your hands anywhere they reach. It could be the top of the chair, it could be the armrest, it could be the hands on the chair seat. But start to lower your right side of your body down to your right leg. You're letting the spine round. We did some twists, we did a little back bend, we did some side bend, and now we're going forward bend. So it might you might be what you might be feeling is a stretch in your left hamstring or your lower back. That might be the most marked if I ask you where do you feel the sensation? I say, well, it's stretch, but then it's feeling of the right thigh on the lower right belly, the top of the right thigh on the lower right abdomen, is actually the therapeutic part of this pose for digestion. And so let's take a breath into that space. Inhale right into your lower right belly. And as you exhale, soften and let the shape of the thigh press gently into the belly. Inhale, let your belly expand into your thigh. Exhale, let the shape of the thigh indent into the belly. Relaxing the belly. One more time. Inhale. Heavy head, relax your neck. Exhale. Slowly come up and change sides. Right foot down, left foot up. There's no fancy entrance into this one, so just go ahead, stable on your right leg. Find your way into the shape of the pose that's right for you. It's not a competition, it's a matter where you're Got it. Starting to bring your torso over that left leg, raising your torso to the left leg. And so maybe there's a little pressure of left thigh to left belly. And then take your breath. Inhale into the left lower belly. Exhale, relax the left lower belly. When you inhale diaphragmatically, the lower belly expands. When you exhale, it will receive. Not muscular effort towards the lower spine. Just let the head hang. Let the shoulders be heavy. It's okay to get here to shrug the shoulders a little bit. Let the back ribs fan open. Soft. Steady in your right leg. Slowly make your way up. And you get to sit again. Thank you for standing. And Stretching in your everyday wear. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of a takeoff of the next home. You might need to scoot a little forward in your chair, but we're going to try and bring a foot on the chair. That might be as far as you get. That might be it. 
These chairs actually, they're rocking us back a little bit. You know what, I'm gonna change it to you. I want you to sit all the way back in the, the chair. It always depends on the prop, right? This particular prop, this chair, scoot all the way back and see if you can post your foot on the chair. It's not happening. It doesn't help with the tight jeans, does it? <laughs> all right, find your best. Maybe you kick the foot a little over towards your left. If needed, you can let the foot rest on your left thigh, or you can even take the foot over your left thigh, or even just cross the legs. But we're bringing the foot, if possible, up so that again, you have the right lower belly in contact with the right thigh, and that's the massaging action. Some of these things, they seem subtle, right? But the body is sensitive. It's a sensitive creature. It's like a flower with petals. If we don't need to take a hammer or whack at it for it to respond. And so even though it's subtle, it's there is an effect happening on, on you as you're here. And the more you do this, the more you do notice that. Let's try and add a little twist to this. You're going to take your elbow inside your knee, the opposite hand on the armrest, and just start to look over your shoulder. So if you have your right knee up, you have your right arm on the inside of the knee. And then the left hand is on the left armrest. And you're looking over your left shoulder. If that's not working, just go ahead and take the ankle across the opposite leg. And then you can twist holding your ankle and turning. You still get that too. You still get the twist. Okay. You just put your hand on your left. Right, so like before, inhale, lift the spine. And exhale, just relax the shoulders. This one, your belly, this one's actually sometimes given to pregnant women. The belly can be very relaxed. Because the way your arms are folding up your chest, your lower back, it's not being pressed on. You've got some space there just from the nature of the arms on the chair and on your leg. See if you can let go way down low in your pelvis, the lower pelvic region, your hip flexors, any gripping there. See if you can release. Let's really sit into the chair. You might have to push down a little through your right heel so your foot doesn't fall off. Take some nice deep breaths into the lower abdomen. See how that feels. Feel free to close your eyes if that's helpful. Go inward. Just being right in this moment, letting go of anything else. What's happening right now for you? And release. Let that could go. Take a pause. See how it feels. Even in between sides. Second side. <coughs> So now if your left leg is up, you're going to bring your left arm inside the left knee. You can also cross the legs, and then you'll bring your hand inside your knee. Right hand onto the armrest. Feel free to lean back in the chair, looking in the direction of the right shoulder. So this is a softer pose because we're near the end of the poses. And so they're getting a little softer, a little quieter. Lean back, let the belly be free. Let it move with the breath. As you inhale, lower belly expands. As you exhale, lower belly will recede. Let even many layers of the abdomen soften. And I'm for obvious reasons, I'm speaking in these poses directly to the bed. But on some days, it might be the last thing you want to think about. And so there's plenty of other places to think about. Lifting the chest, rolling the right collarbone back. Feeling the left heel pressing into the chair, the right foot on the earth. So this is an, a way with discomfort and pain, is to direct away from that area. And many of the benefits are still going to be happening. You don't think about that, that directly. Thing with yoga, even if it's not yoga for digestion, it's just yoga, that you will get many benefits to 
in your digestive system. And slowly release. Like that pose also can be given for the sacrum, for lower back issues. Mm. They have many benefits. All right, you've got one more. You're all prepped for it. The next one, you're going to scoop four or five back to the middle of the chair again. Feet it back a distance, and you're going down. Hold it down. You can hold your elbows. You can hold the chair. You can have the hands rest on the floor. Why are the legs wide? Again, so that the right thigh is near the ascending colon, the left thigh near the descending colon. Would you squeeze your abdomen here? No. Relax the belly. Really, really let it go and allow the breath to move through you like wind through trees. Let the breath move through your body. Take one more deep breath in, and then when you exhale, roll up through your spine. And take a moment to observe how you are feeling. And here's this quote, yoga is like music, the rhythm of the body, and the melody of the mind, and the harmony of the soul creates something of life. Vikas Ayengar, he has a form of yoga um, that is, it's all things, but they have a strong medical component. Um, and so you can find Ayengar yoga teachers that can be sometimes ideal for uh, if you're going through something. But really all yoga, just find something that resonates with you and do that. Find, find your place, your group. I myself, I'm only, like I said, maybe I'm speaking on class right now on Saturday mornings. Um, but this city is chock full of really talented yoga teachers. So um, I encourage you to, if you went to one and you're like, oh, it's not for me, try a different kind. Maybe it'll be a yangar, maybe something else. Uh, my husband suffered from Crohn's disease and asked me now, and he was just talking to me how um, even though Crohn's didn't, uh, yoga didn't, he did a yangar yoga, it didn't cure him, but he said it helped him um, spread out the flares and uh, he did it all along, you know, before the surgery, and he comes to my class, um, and that it helps him just cope with the many aspects of having a Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Oh, it's a class. It's a class. I, I, uh, everyone. Uh, yoga is for everyone. Not everybody should go to the hand. I think that what um, she was saying is, is absolutely correct as well. There's so many not good teachers, not good classes, and there's so much talent in this city. So it's a matter of uh, if people trust you. Yes. The most important question I get all the time is, is well, I'm not flexible, you know, I mean, I can't even my knees, let alone touch my toes. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what physical condition you have, they can be adapted to you. Uh, I'm very grateful for you. From something that has existed for several thousand years, uh, we're going 180 degrees to that which is evolving this morning yesterday, this week, but certainly in the last two decades for sure. Uh, we have a, a wonderful opportunity to hear from uh, Brandon uh, Burkhead, who has uh, come to us as a project scientist working in the area of virtual reality. Uh, he's in our uh, little position, he's in our master's program in health delivery sciences, and he's uh, uh, involved in our uh, research program here in exploring the use of virtual reality in a variety of settings, but he has a particular interest in pain reduction. Hello. Um, So, um, 
So yeah, so I've, I've been working in virtual reality research for about the last three years. Um, for the positions that are within our group, we have about 40 or 50 positions around uh, different providers um, around the world that work on VR research. It's about the average for the MD ones. Psychologists have probably been doing this for two decades. Um, so MDs are a bit late to the game, but we're, uh, we're, we are moving quickly uh, on getting kind of trialed out and working on things. Uh, just to show hands, who's heard of virtual reality before? Okay, good. That's actually something that's been quite refreshing in LA, the amount of people have heard of it, versus uh, where I've trained uh, in the Midwest, over at Clinic, and down in the South. Um, it's not as uh, as well known as me. So uh, I'll just run over a few key things I do with whenever I'm giving a talk on virtual reality. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on chronic pain, that there's been enough studies that there's probably pilot data and probably early data in that area, but uh, hasn't yet been any randomized control data like there has been for acute pain. Um, so, you know, disclosures, it's time. Uh, just, I'm going to try to go over some key definitions that uh, related to this area. Uh, one or two studies related to acute pain, those that relate to actually abdominal pain, and then um, uh, and then a few of the studies I've done, and then just we'll go through for chronic pain, given how early it is, I really think the most interesting part is what all are people doing in the area? Because chronic pain is so complex and challenging, uh, you really have to get quite creative in how you uh, create a virtual experience for that. Uh, so as far as definitions go, the most important terms of the virtual reality is immersion and presence. So uh, this is when a person feels a sense of being in a virtual world. That's a feeling. Patients have a presence. So uh, my example for this is immersion is more on the technical end. If you're talking for us, talking to developers or people making things, when you go from a standard definition TV to a high definition TV, it's the amount of pixels you go over. Um, usually it's over a thousand pixels. Um, but for the person watching the TV, what I noticed the first day I got my father bought high definition TV was that I could see sweat on the football team, right, the football, <laughs> on the football players. Seeing that was immersive. I, or I had a sense of presence. I felt closer to the game the day we got the HD TV than I did the day before we had much fuzzier standard definition TV. So that's just a bit of a way to try to relate those two terms, though it's quite different, a little bit more immersive with uh, virtual reality than just going up on the clarity of the, of the resolution. Um, as far as the terms you might hear, virtual reality, augmented reality, over time in the next coming years, you'll start to hear the words mixed reality. Just to try to demystify these terms, it's all about the number of pixels in front of your face. So virtual reality, your entire vision is pixels. Everything's digital. Augmented reality uh, would be, you might just have some information in front of you, or even if you're doing like Snapchat or Instagram, they have like the Snapchat or Instagram faces, that's technically augmented reality. It's a little bit of digital information. Mixed reality is a little bit more accurate, and it's pretty, not sci-fi, but it's here. Uh, two companies have augmented mixed reality devices. That's where a computer actually can tell where everything is in space around you, and it can project images at exact locations. So underneath a desk, you can't see the object until you actually look underneath the desk. Um, and so that will have, uh, it's not totally known all the different implications for that, but it will be quite a useful device for um, probably surgical guidance and education, areas like that. This is just another way of showing this field of view for virtual reality is completely covered with digital images. Your phone, phone based AR is quite common now, actually. And then these, uh, more um, accurately placed objects with mixed reality. A couple of the devices you might have seen, this one goes for a mobile phone device can actually fit in there. That's been the biggest boost for VR, is actually phones being able to use uh, digital images. But there are things called caves, it's just for use of projector. So you don't have to have something on your head, it covers your entire field of view. These have been used a lot for rehab, there's probably Easily over 100 publications using virtual reality for rehab with caves uh, over the last 15, 20 years. Again, talked about the phone. Uh, and then these devices, this is a HoloLens, uh, another one's called Magic Leap. Essentially, it's a visor you can see through. And again, there's 
a bunch of cameras on top of it that are be able to recreate the world and put objects uh, in front of you. So that's just to kind of give a little bit of uh, context. This is the world's first 360 degree uh, video of a surgery. This is a, a doctor, Dr. Shafi Ahmed. He uh, did this over uh, Snapchat or Instagram. He, he was able to have, I think, over 10,000 medical students around the world watch the procedure with him. Uh, so that was uh, quite impressive. He's over in the UK. That's the 360 degree. And again, for, for me, everything's going to be somewhat evolving over the every six months. Somebody's going to come out with a new device. And it can be a bit bewildering, but what, what makes it easier for me is to put everything on a spectrum. No matter what company comes out with what, it's all going to be about the number of pixels in front of your face to some degree. And then it'll be about how much sensory information is it gathering? How much tracking? Is it tracking my movement? Is it, uh, is, does it have you know, audio that when I turn my head, I hear the train more versus when I turn away? Uh, those are all ways that make it more immersive or more like what reality is for us. Um, surprisingly to me, I think that's so frustrating for this, is that actually video games are considered virtual reality, which is confusing in the literature because a lot of people will start calling a video game playing in 64 virtual reality. But technically, it's called non immersive VR because clearly the screen is so small that there's not a way to, for it to actually feel like you're in it, but to some degree, it is interactive. Um, so it's just a note. Um, so for pain, one of the biggest studies that happened, uh, there's essentially two researchers, Hunter Hoffman of the University of Washington in the year 2000 started making programs for children who had 30 degree burns on most of their body. And doing wound dressing changes are quite painful. So they needed to find a way to try to help kids get through these wound dressing changes. So he built something called Snow World, which is in the corner here, those snowmen. He would shoot the snowmen and they would, uh, you know, uh, go away. Uh, and so he then tested this on uh, undergrads. This is healthy undergrads. That there is actually a plastic VR headset. So when you go into an fMRI, it would just destroy it if it was the regular headset. But what he noticed was is that when you look at VR, uh, uh, when you use VR here versus no VR, there's a drastic decrease in areas of the brain that are related to pain signaling. So about a 50% reduction in the amount of pain signaling. Usually these two are more cortical, so this is how you feel things. And the insula, the thalamus, has sometimes the emotional component of pain. Uh, and so this is... Um, this was impressive. This was definitely was the first functional MRI study with virtual reality. What they did was for these healthy undergrads is that 16 minutes the fMRI is on the whole time. They have a little uh, heating coil down here, um, and then they would put that on the feet to stimulate pain, and then that would come on every two minutes for 30 seconds, but the VR was only on for half of it. So that's how you can get data across that. Uh, they even did a follow-up study with opiates and found that they, without VR, of course, will be shown to decrease areas of pain. But uh, with VR, they actually worked synergistically. We, they honestly didn't know what would you know, be the combination, whether we you know, not, didn't, don't work well together. Uh, this population had no side effects with VR. Uh, you can have nausea uh, and some times headache from eye strain with VR, um, and probably. Uh, be five percent of the population, uh, as far as the exact who who will be most likely. It's hard to say. I usually ask patients um, in our studies whether they have troubles with getting on an airplane or a boat without using medication. That's some level of indication for whether they're going to have some challenges with uh, the stimulus system in VR. So there actually are a couple studies with abdominal pain, and uh, thankfully, Dr. Brent Spiegel, uh, our, our my, my PI and, and, and director of the program uh, knows all of them, uh, and so that's fantastic. The first one uh, is actually a pretty large one. This is 165 patients. Uh, they were using this uh, with patient-controlled sedation, actually during colonoscopies. Uh, and so this was um, three different groups. Uh, one group just had visuals. So this is actually a TV headset. They're actually pretty uh, 
affordable now. These, this was done actually in the year 2004. Uh, so that's nature scenes or scenic scenes that they're using. Then the second group had the audio with the visual, so that would be scenic scenes with you know water dripping or whatever the sound coming from that scenic uh, nature video. And then the third group just did their patient control sedation, um, and so. They actually found a, a decrease in the amount of times they clicked for sedation for uh, the audiovisual group, more so than just the visual, and then more so than just the sedation by itself. Um, so that was a, quite interesting when he uh, sent that my way. I, I did not uh, find that before uh, when he sent that over to me. And then also for the more modern virtual reality experiences, uh, Dr. Prince Beagle is the only one that I've been able to find in published literature to look at abdominal pain specifically with VR. So he has uh, over, in the published uh, paper, it was over uh, 20, 20 patients. They had a range of different abdominal pains. Some of them did have IBD, some had pancreatitis, some had uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, it was a wide range, and they all had about the same reduction. And in almost all the literature, the reduction related to VR. Is anywhere between 20% and 33% uh, in pain on your scale. So if someone asks you, you know, the one out of 10 pain, let's say it goes from a seven, the VR, the prediction would be that we go to a five or so. Um, and so, yeah, so that it's, it was interesting to see that it's across any cause, they were about the same amount of reduction. Um, and so with my research that I've done, Originally, actually, I built programs for dental anxiety. There's actually over 20 publications now for dental anxiety using different types of hypnotic displays. And we did pilot studies back when I was in Tennessee in a couple of private practice dental offices. Mainly, we found a correlation between the level of dental anxiety and how much the VR experience actually helped, um, which was interesting. And then uh, another study that I developed at Mayo Clinic uh, was for seeing how affordable VR can help with pain. So this is healthy populations. Google Cardboard's 10 bucks now, and you can put pretty much any iPhone or Android in it. And then the pain that we used to simulate it in the health populations is essentially an ice bucket. So I quite commonly used uh, probably about 150 studies using an ice bucket. Um, and quite safe in pediatric adults. Um, and uh, so we did that in both Mayo Clinic Arizona and Mayo Clinic uh, Minnesota, Rochester Commission. Uh, originally, I was actually testing it out uh, in my apartment. I would test out how, what's the right apparatus to use for, uh, for the, the, the cold presser test for the ice bucket um, before we actually finalized the, the the protocol at Mayo Clinic, which is uh, just finished accrual. I'm really excited for all the students that have been involved. They're actually getting to publish their uh, first paper with it, which is going to be great. Um, and I'm uh, really proud of the group. The program we use is a free program called INCEL. Uh, it's similar to what's been done in VR research uh, in that it has continuous content to use throughout the time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. And um, it worked great. Um, so, we'll see, uh, see the, res the final results of that soon. Currently, the study we're doing here, the largest study we have going on, is for orthopedic injury. So, we're working with the orthopedic department to see how we can help with pain after they leave the hospital. So, usually, what have would happen is someone would have um, you know, some type of accident or trauma um, after their surgery. You know, uh, you know, I or one of the other members of the team would, would meet them and discuss kind of uh, uh, the, the study itself. And what we're seeing here is one's an active control, so we're just following their activity uh, with a Fitbit. And then the other one is actual VR in the TENS unit. We have the TENS unit to try to see if we can help with pain both from the peripheral nervous system uh, and from the actual central nervous system from the brain. And so we're looking at a lot of different factors. Uh, it'll be the largest, longest study because the patients get it for 60 days at home. So we're trying to ask, answer the question of uh, how is how is this working as far as outside the home? It's a mobile device that uses a phone. The TENS unit is at CVS or Walgreens. So these devices are already at the home, so we figure we might as well should be studied uh, to see if it's actually effective. Um, 
uh, in that context. It's been, been shown to be effective inside the hospital. Uh, it's here been used for all sorts of things, mostly painful procedures. So with wound dressing changes, uh, let's see, during, uh, during birthing, there's a clinical trial here for obstetrics. There's an episiotomy, uh, dentistry, neurologic procedures, and uh, needle-based procedures for children, uh, IV injections. Um, and then rehab, quite common, has been used for 20 years. Chronic pain is fairly new, and family limb pain uh, with the senior pulmonary year therapy. Uh, and so uh, for chronic pain, just show kind of more of what they're currently using. There are several pilot studies, but I don't want to get too high into the details of the of the, of the data. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to Dr. Diane Gramala of Canada. It, she's probably you know the, the leading founder, the mother of you know virtual reality chronic pain research. Almost all of the programs that are being used are things that she's built her lab. Uh, she's actually coming to our virtual medicine conference in March, uh, and so that'll be a really great talk. Uh, she originally worked at Apple uh, back in the 80s and 90s, and then now has been doing uh, and been an academic researcher since since the early nineties. Uh, so she's built. Go back. <laughs> she built these uh, one one game. She built was otter games. So this is uh, for you to be able to uh, play with otters, but also interact with them. Essentially, the premise for all of her games are three things. One is the content is a moderate amount of activity, and that you don't want to play something too complicated. You're undergoing a procedure, you don't want to be frustrated by a virtual reality experience. Uh, you don't want to be too mundane because the whole point of it is to garner conscious focus on pain. Most likely, all this working at 20 to 30 percent of pain reduction is because we have a certain amount of control at the conscious level of the amount of pain we're perceiving. And so um, that that is essentially the two underlying principles. Uh, she's also been doing a fantastic job with feedback loops. So either you'll be adding a heart rate monitor, uh, or uh, in this case, a uh, galvanic skin response. Uh, they use them for lie detectors or uh, and, uh, other things. Usually, to a sense of sweat, and that causes we know as arousal when you begin to sweat. So, um, so there's a fog here. So as you get more engaged with the virtual reality experience, the fog lessens. The audio becomes uh, uh, improved and more 360, uh, so you become more immersed. So that's something that we're currently using a program that gauges your breath. So you do deep breathing during the virtual reality experience, and uh, as you breathe, the uh, world actually changes in size, and lighting actually changes. Uh, and so that's been quite quite uh, quite useful to have that type of feedback loop. Um, and these are just a few more games that she built uh, for different types of chronic pain populations. Most all these studies I'm showing are anywhere between 11 patients and 30 patients uh, that they're uh, you know, looking at in their pilot studies. Um, this one's actually down in San Diego. Uh, there's a virtual uh, medical center there, virtual reality medical center there. This is just exploring different types of virtual scenes. Uh, and then this is really that snow world that I talked about in the fMRI. This is the newest kind of version of it uh, that's been used uh, in a one paper down in Tennessee, where I'm from. Actually, met the gentleman uh, and did the program. And uh, he's had his latest papers with 30 chronic pain patients and showed a 60% reduction in pain. It's quite quite high. Um, and uh, it's also been used in uh, Washington. Uh, in um, Seattle to decrease actually opiate use. There's, one, there's been now one paper that actually showed a decrease in, in fentanyl use with VR. Um, uh, there is the latest now shift is that now they're doing weekly programs. So because chronic pain is a long term uh, battle that's cyclic, many different groups are testing out uh, kind of regimented uh, content. Uh, and so that's probably on the rise. Right now, there's just one or two papers that are published with that, but that will be happening. Um, by far, the most interesting, I think, for me, for me has been a, a program called Virtual Embodiment. Uh, this is where you can actually cause a sense of 
connectedness to the virtual avatar. So essentially what this is based off is something called mirror therapy. Uh, if you have a hand that cannot well, work properly or has some type of dysfunction and you uh, hide that hand behind a mirror, they've done uh, dozens of studies showing that if you show the opposite hand moving, over time our brain starts to believe that the hand that's not working is actually moving. And that can have therapeutic benefit in the sense that they'll either start to actually try to engage that hand with less pain, or um, if they have phantom limb pain, no one, they'll actually have a decrease in phantom limb pain when you use the opposite hand. Uh, and so that's uh, been uh, quite, quite, uh, quite interesting for us. Um, there've been a few studies with chronic pain uh, actually using uh, a sense of out-of-body experience. So. Um, I can try to show a video of that as it's probably easier to see than to explain. So, let's do this. He doesn't have sand. This, this is a gentleman out in Spain who built a program that participants describe virtual world. There's a mirror in it. All virtual embodiment programs always have mirrors inside their programs. So you can actually see the movement of the avatar, and it moves with you. You have, usually have some type of motion tracker on, uh, and they perform specific types of exercises uh, to be able to what they call kind of walk into the virtual avatar. Uh, and then there's these balls. The balls are actually pretty key because there's usually some type of haptic feedback on the wrist. And so that will actually, when the ball is hit in the virtual world, in the real world, uh, you feel that uh, haptic all. Uh, and so it's all syncing. The, the synchrony of virtual environments is key to being able to feel that sense of, uh, of connection. And uh, in a second, it will go to where it actually moves. So then at this point, we start seeing movement away from the virtual avatar. And the balls are still hitting, but the sensors have been turned off. And then uh, this is causing a, uh, an actual uh, virtual out-of-body experience. Uh, and the two studies that have been done uh, either has had, uh, all of them have been positive effects. They've all had a sense of calmness, uh, or uh, in the chronic pain population, they've had a decrease in pain, again, around 30%. Uh, that was done over in Sweden. Uh, so this is very, uh, like he said, uh, very new, and, but we're very interested in seeing how uh, all this can be used uh, within the context of the of the hospital. Um, now that we've done a little bit of meditation, I just show a couple of things. This is Tai Chi in virtual reality. Stanford's been using it for um, has been using it for uh, a few different neurological related rehab movement disorders. Um, So that's their predicament. I'm trying to be using that one. Uh, a few other ones we have. And then this is uh, Dr. Kim Bullock over here. Chronic pain disappeared and quickly. The up the pain only for at least Bullock's a week. Great. And then for some people, they may have many months of the pain relief. Yeah, I see that. So, what are these patients doing in the virtual world? For Pierre, he's actually moving his pain free arm. But when he looks through the goggles, he sees the injured arm doing the work. The in this case, That's trying to pop balloons that are floating all around him. Okay. After just five sessions, he says his pain disappeared. The cost to me was really minimum, you know, just a little bit of time and no side effects. Dr. Sean Mackey, one of the nation's top pain experts, says the treatment works by tricking the brain. And that's where the excitement for VR comes in, is the opportunity to rewire our brains into a more normal state so that we're not experiencing as much pain. Is this the future of pain management? I think it's one of the critical futures of pain management. Oh, yes. For patients like Pierre, the future is already here. Dr. John Torres, NBC News, Skillet, let alone... And then we've got... Uh, this other one's the most recent update to uh, the Snow World program that's been used. It's, the, so it's usually uh, going down some type of stream or canal, uh, 
uh, and then there are different types of remember the otter from the uh, from what Dr. Diane Ramala had. There's actually otters in the water. So again, this this different program is using a lot of her uh, techniques, um, uh, and uh, you can actually able to change colors uh, with the uh, with the program. I believe this one is actually the company that we've used for our uh, work here. Applied VR transforms the patient experience. Instead of fear and anxiety, your medical procedure can become less stressful and, in many cases, even enjoyable. Choose a guided meditation, tour a beautiful place, or play a game. Use it before, during, or after your procedure, depending on your treatment. Your nurse will fit you with the headset, show you how it works. Once it's on, You'll be transported to a whole new world with a stunning 360 degree view. Just turn your head to look around and explore. We believe virtual reality helps patients, improves post procedural outcomes, and can ultimately solve some of the biggest challenges facing healthcare today. To experience the power of applied VR, ask your doctor or nurse for a trial. That's pretty much everything. Any questions? So, if someone has IBD pain on a daily basis, would you say they should do this for a half hour a day, or would you? What What would the suggestion be to how to go every time they have pain to plug in? Or yeah. So, um, so currently for our orthopedic injury patients, our prescriptions usually are three times daily. With any, uh, if there is an episode of pain, to use it. Uh, usually, if they can before, but many times hard to tell when they're going to pain, so it's usually after the insight of pain. Uh, so for them, for the orthopedic injury patients, when they do their therapy, is their greatest moments of pain because that's when they're moving their uh, surgical site and whatnot. So usually it's after that event. They usually do it for 10 to 20 minutes, some will move up to 30 minutes. Uh, and then it's morning, lunch, and dinner, but I, Patients are pretty mobile and they're actually doing you now transitioning back to work. And you know, we definitely are open to saying short morning and night. Um, and whatever fits. Uh, at this point, it's still kind of more of a supportive care model. When I mean, there's pain, we use it, but we are trying to work out what is the optimal timeline, but that will probably come out in the next couple studies. Um, and I think there is some interest in the hospital to do an IBD specific clinical trial. Uh, we haven't yet. Um, found that specific uh, position within the group to do to, to work within that, but we do have ongoing interest in uh, study for pancreatic pain uh, and uh, pancreatitis. Like those might be coming out next two years. You don't simply don't know the answer. Yeah. That, uh, it's, that's been done. That, but, uh, the importance is to bring to you the field so that you can have a better understanding. Do you think that it works by reducing anxiety or simply a distraction? What do you think actually takes place? And I base that on two weeks ago, a grandson of a very tired driver, uh, I'm not sure exactly what goes on, but it, it, you're in it, you're in that world. And it, it, it's a, the effect on chronic pain, it, it, how does it do? Right, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, so acute pain, probably the distraction is a large portion. The theory that that's been uh, proposed uh, has been something called spotlight theory of attention. So uh, usually conscious that we have the ability to, to focus on just a few, one thing at a time. And we have some ability to selectively uh, attend to something, but also selectively uh, not think about something if we really try to focus on it. So VR might be a way of actually um, garnering our bandwidth to a certain degree, and so that is probably attention. There is some subpopulations that have residual effects from VR that does seem to have some benefit on pain. So again, the, the group in Tennessee did show a tail effect to the VR in that there is uh, about 20% of their patients had pain relief for uh, several hours to up to 72 hours. Um, we're not sure yet what these kind of high presence patients are, what's their demographic and, and why is it that it works for them. But in that population, 
they may have, uh, there, there's some delay or shifting between kind of that sensation from the virtual to the, to the reals. Maybe there's some benefit there, but again, we'll have to do more uh, long-term surveys, uh, longitudinal studies, which we'll try to do. So how far do you think we are away from this being commonly used for pain management? Yeah, so there's a few that are going through FDA processing right now uh, for pain. Uh, and so there's probably, the first FDA approval was done by MindBase, so they're using it for uh, neurologic related uh, rehab. Um, and then uh, a few others that are looking at it for acute pain during procedures and after. I think based on the amount of research we have for randomized control trials for procedure pain and post-op pain, that probably will happen in the next uh, couple of years, but then chronic pain, which is now the real focus for the field overall, is um, is probably going to be several years because we really need to get a, a, a randomized a several randomized control trials to see a good trend in effect. And will it be used like in, in the PT and OT fields? Absolutely, yeah, yes. there's a lot, a lot of PTOT. So PTOT, there are four different programs that are registered with the FDA, mm -hmm. um, and so that uh, mostly on the East Coast seems to have about 14 rehab centers that relate to uh, EMGH and Harvard systems that are using that. So they may also go through the FDA pilot program. It's hard to tell with digital therapeutics what the FDA is going to do. It looks like they know that they will have a really hard time with digital because every update could technically be a new therapy. And so I think what they're trying to do right now, the nine companies that are getting FDA clearance, which is Apple for the watch, Fitbit for their watch, uh, a few other companies for um, genetics and whatnot, is that they want to follow them for two years. And then once they go through a two year process, the FDA gives them a stamp of whether they think they're ethically and, and, and whatnot fitting their worth to be approved for their programs that continue to on yeah. In the meantime, are you doing clinical trials here? Yeah, yeah, so we've got, um, orthopedics has two different studies, an inpatient study and an outpatient study, running the outpatient study. Uh, we had several inpatient pain-related studies. Uh, Dr. Burns has finished um, five, five or six now. And then uh, there's a pediatric study that's under development, uh, two pancreatic studies that are under development. Um, and uh, like I said, our colleagues probably at Stanford are developing multiple uh, in about the same time window. Yeah. I think you have to look at decades, not days. Like any form of therapeutic intervention has been issues. This is really preliminary. Yeah. It would seem to be a good marriage between the entertainment industry and the medical field. Is that being explored right now? Um, as far as having more content, that would be great. Yeah, no, we, we don't have enough. Uh, so, so like 360 video content is needed. Um, there's there's some content out there. So YouTube does have some that we curated, but um, more content would be better, particularly because I don't think we have enough for to really for the diversity of interest that patients have. Um, and so, yeah, that's a good idea. We have one more presentation that uh, thank you very much. This is the next uh, presentation yeah, is something that I have received uh, in early notice. So I look forward to having uh, uh, with us uh, Reverend Mason mm -hmm. Kelly, who is a board certified chaplain. There's all kinds of things, but uh, uh, the Reiki uh, approach is both provocative and controversial, and uh, she knows all about it. She will share with us her perceptions. Hello. I know we're running late, so I'll try to keep mine as short as possible. Um, so, Reiki, like a rake, that's how we pronounce it, like a rake. Reiki is um, I like 
So the word Reiki, this is something like yoga that's thousands of years old and is making a big comeback and we're using it in the hospital. Um, I've trained, I think about 10 of our chaplains now, including Rabbi Weiner. Um, so it is approved by all of the big rabbis in Israel. It's approved by um, all the people that needed to approve it here at the hospital. So Reiki is, the word Reiki means universal life energy. So what it is about is energy balancing and relaxation within the body. And it's a hands-on therapy that we use. These are the, some of the benefits that can be um, felt from it. It reduces stress, it promotes a mind-body connection, and um, <clears throat> it fosters natural self-healing. It really connects you back to your body and it can relieve, relieve pain and discomfort, and it can be a spiritual practice for some people, although it's not assigned to any specific religion at all. So it's an inner faith. So here's our chakra lady, and I'm sure you've heard the word chakra. Has anyone not heard that word? Okay. We're in LA, so everybody's heard chakra, right? <laughs> so the idea of chakras is that we have these energy areas within our body, and they're connected to certain body parts, but they're also connected to our psychology and our emotions and our spirituality. So it's sort of mystical in the sense that it's the idea that our body has memories. And when we've experienced things in our life, like trauma of different kinds, or stress, or anxiety, or pain, or fear, love, joy, hope, all those things are living within our body somewhere, and we can touch on them. So if you think about it, when you think about when you say my heart feels broken, we can actually do studies and see that we can we can see where your heart is affected by sadness. We can check that. And so you really do have, in a sense, a broken heart. So I'm going to go over the chakras with you a little bit. Um, oops. Okay. So the idea of when we come in and we do, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Or is it better? Okay. When we come in to do Reiki on patients, we use, we use it on pediatric patients, even leaky babies. Um, because we've done it on, on moms that are here on bed rest for a long period of time and they have a lot of stress and we want to keep them really grounded and landed. So we come into the room and we do Reiki on them. And the idea is that you are touching on these chakras, like on our chakra lady, we're bringing attention to them. It's almost like um, the spiritual care, how we talk about people need a witness to their pain. They need to be seen and heard. So what we're doing is we're bringing attention to those areas that are hurting, and we're bringing the intention of healing and peace and relaxation. So the patient just relaxes. We go into patient rooms all the time. We probably have 62, 70 referrals a month for inpatient, and most now, most of them are coming from the chronic pain and the pain management team. We're part of that actual menu to try to help with the opioid crisis and pain. Um, I've done Reiki on people in acute panic attacks, people that are going in with MRI and are afraid, um, kids having panic attacks. So we come in and we touch on the chakras lightly. We can cover too if you're not comfortable to touch. And we bring attention to that area. And then the patient sort of relaxes and breathes. There's nothing the patient has to do. It's just about receiving. So we bring attention to those areas, and we either try to warm up the area if it feels a little cold, or we try to sort of relax it and dissipate all the energies that might have. So the idea of the chakras, we have them all over our bodies, hundreds of them. But we have seven main ones, and the seven main ones are the ones we concentrate. So we even have them in our feet and hands. So if anyone has little kids or kiddos at home, or, and all of a sudden they're just standing with you at Ralph's and they just start jumping around, banging on their feet, the idea of the feet chakra is that the idea is that it's 
tell you, it's bringing you forward. They want us to keep you moving. So the kids will jump on their feet because they're so ready to live and be alive and they just want to experience it. So when you have kids that are having trouble sleeping, you could do some therapy, some Reiki therapy and calming their little feet before they go to bed. And it actually brings in a little ritual that they love because they're like, okay, it's time to get to ready for bed. I'm going to get my feet and calm myself and help myself sleep. So it's just a little tip for any parents who have kids out there. So the idea of the chakras, we have the seven main ones, and they start, and you can kind of go over them. I was thinking of you too, like a self-weight, but you can kind of go over them as you tell. The first one is at the root of your spine, right here. And that one, and they all have colors associated with them. They all have yoga poses. They have sounds. There's a, there's a whole sort of uh, science to it, as it were, which can be really fun for people to explore. But the root chakra is the one that is about security and being landed and being safe. Kind of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the things that you really need to be okay. Food, water, shelter, community, family, safety. So when something's going on in your life, there's a divorce or a death of a loved one, or you're moving or something, you lost your job, big things like that, the root chakra is really unbalanced. And that's sort of the building block. So the lower chakras are considered more base or more masculine in a Jungian sense, not a healthy female, but in a Jungian sense. And then the upper chakras are more enlightened. So when the base one is off, which we can feel with our homeless patients, we can feel with people going through huge losses, the other ones aren't as safe to feel so like grounded. So you're a little bit off. So the idea is that you're working on that. So when you're sitting down, you can work on it by just putting your hands on your upper thighs, you're sort of getting to that. Or if you're sitting, you can reach your back. You can sort of work on that too. And the idea is that you sort of warm your hands up. And think about what it is that you need today. I need to be restored. I need energy. I need comfort. I need healing. Whatever that intention is, and then you start to work on that, and it's almost meditation with touch in yourself. And you work on that area and you breathe into it. And what you're gonna notice, the more connected, the more time, the more time you work on this, you're gonna start to feel and be really connected to your body. So you're gonna start to say, okay, this is what's going on. This is what's happening for me now. Something you can do. When you feel stress, when something's happening, so when you're sitting in traffic and someone does something that drives you nuts, and that's what's going to happen every day, that just wears it in your body and feel it as if you got it. Is it your heart? Does your neck tense out? And that is what each of these chakras are associated to those areas. So the second one, and the bit that's the second one in our digestive one, is a big one, is it the fullest part of your belly, so where you have the most. Uh, Back, right? And uh, this is when we want to celebrate that area. So, this is your creative chakra. And this is all about um, feelings and creativity. So, if you're an artist, and it's very interesting to note that the root chakra, the base of all things, is so close to the creative chakra that tells us how creative we are. We really need creativity. So, you can nurture the chakra by taking in art, and you can also nurture it by creating art. But this is also our intuitive gut. You know, I call it the holy belly. Network. And we talk about the belly being the second mind. So this is really important to listen to your gut. When we don't listen to our gut and honor what our gut is telling us, we can get cramped in our belly, we can get constipated, we can have pain in our belly. So it's all connected. Our mind, body, and spirit are all connected. So giving attention to your belly really relaxing your stomach and giving that attention to it, breathing into it, this can be wonderful for me. And you can have other patient at Cedars would be more than happy to be a gift to you if you're here. And then the next one is here, your solar plexus. And this is the one that is your self-confidence and how you move your ego, right? So if you're living in one of these areas more than the other, you're going to be able to feel it because one area is going to feel a lot warmer, a lot more engaged. The others might feel a little colder and not have as much attention. So if you're someone that has this 
really strong ego, but you're not listening to your heart and your gut and your throat and your mind, then you're living in one spot. And we need to nurture that ego. We need to feel connected to it. And that's also part of our digestive area, too, our liver and all of this. So we want that to, you know, when you stand tall and you see ballerinas, you see people walking that are walking very confidently, you can sort of see their, um, their self confidence in the way they move. So that's that chakra. And then the heart is the big, the really big. We have studies that have been done that if you just hold your heart, you just put your hand on your heart, you will actually release the feel good hormone, the hormone that relaxes you. It's a scientific study, you know it. So the idea, like if you're holding a child, maybe you're holding your dog, you're holding each other, that feeling of your heart relaxing is really, really healing and powerful. And so it's a clearinghouse of all your emotions. You have your fear, your love, your anxiety, your hope, all of that is in your heart. So something you can do when you feel anxious is to just check in with your heart. Just hold your heart. When you're going to the doctor, when you're waiting in the waiting room and things are taking long and you're feeling anxious, just hold on to your heart. When you're watching TV, when you're watching the news, when things are really hard for us, there's so much going on in the world that is so hard for us. I mean, it touches our heart. It's very easy to talk to someone. You can talk to them like this, right? And just have your hand on your heart. It's almost the idea of like protecting your heart, holding your heart, honoring your own feelings. So checking in with yourself and, and, and holding on to that, breathing into that. You can't sleep. It's a really good one. I do it at night, and you break me at night, and I wake up with my heart and my heart is anxious. And then the next chakra is the throat. And this is about communication, self-expression, saying what you need to say. It's also communication with each other. You know, other people, how you're receiving what people say. So speaking your truth. So sometimes if you have a lot going on in your life and you need to have a conversation with somebody that might be difficult, um, you can get really tense. I don't know if any of you get neck tension. I can hear, we can hear it in our throat, <clears throat> right? We can hear our throat. We might not feel as if we're speaking in the, the, the voice that we feel the most confident in. So it's really good to nurture the throat chakra too and warm that up. Especially as patients, even though, even if your doctor is the most amazing doctor, and we have so many good doctors here that will listen to you and honor you, you still might be and say, so, so nurturing that chakra and warming that up before you go to the meeting is really important. And then the third eye is right here, and I'm sure you guys have seen where a Hindu woman wears a ring, right? They wear a jewel right here. So the idea of that is they're putting a physical reminder of what they want. So they're asking for enlightenment and they're asking for knowledge by putting a jewel right here. So this is this is your enlightened chakra, right? Just like your belly. This is your enlightened chakra. So this is where you meditate and you, you uh, pray and you read things that are sacred and you kind of nurturing it through meditation with yoga all nurtures this third eye. But it's also your knowledge, so you get busy, really spinning. Does anyone get a 3 a.m. wake up, a little heart? Right? 3 a.m. Everybody does me. You have to wake up and you can't, you're perseverating. Oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. You know, and I've had patients say, you know, I had gotten no sleep last night, but I got three solid hours of work. So that's good. So, you know, you have to really calm that. So, again, just giving attention to that chakra, just even rubbing this right here to soothe it, to just calm it. Works with kiddos, works with dogs and cats. Just to see that, because you know, this is where we get that line, right? When we're worried, when we're anxious, the big Botox area everybody goes to. <laughs> this is really good to sort of calm this, to really soothe it, and try to release some of that tension. So it's being, it's sort of a practical, sometimes people think it sounds a bit silly, but it's a practical connection with the self that helps with the stress. And then the top one, on our lady here, this is the crown chakra, right? 
So this is where we see the rabbis were the kippah. This is the idea of like having this humility of God, having this coverage of this area. And of course, in kippah, we see religious art, we see new age art, with things coming out of the top of the head, with beautiful lights. So this is the idea that this is the highest form of communication with that which is bigger, with the divine, with God, with the universe, whatever your tradition is, that this is the highest form of that communication. So that one can be nurtured with prayer, meditation, sacred things, whatever, with nature, whatever brings you closer to that which is bigger. And the idea with this one is soothing that one and releasing it, bringing it, and releasing it to that which is bigger than you. Because you can't carry it all. You can't have that all. So that's a really good one to nurture to feel how if it feels a little cold, you want to warm it up. Um, if anyone has a baby at home or in a baby home, just put your hand on the top of their head and see what you feel. It is so hot. So they're just warm, warm, warm. Because they just got here. So they are all full of that, which is bigger. And it's really beautiful to feel that. So try to see if you have that in your life at all. So we can try just a little bit of it if you'd like to try some for yourself to walk to where you're going. So I usually have my little printer printer music, you know, and the spa stuff. And they all have birds with them. It's a whole fun thing. So the idea is just for the moment, set aside your conditioned ideas and expectations. Make yourself empty for a moment and open and receive. It's just pretty So what you want to do, we'll just work on a few places. And we have um, me and another Reiki master, Dr. Aaron Reed, who is a supportive care doctor. We uh, lead a self-reiki that's open to everybody. A half hour self-reiki every Monday at one o'clock in our chapel. So you're all welcome to come to that at any time. And that's actually broadcast into 950 patient rooms we have. So the patients can tune in. We have mindfulness meditation in the chapel at noon on Thursday. Um, Dr. Paula Rabbits from Moves the Way, she's wonderful. She comes and leads that. Everyone's welcome to that. Any, anything we have going on in the chapel, you're always welcome to come and participate, learn, and be a part. So let's just take a moment to warm up our hands, get really comfortable in your chair. Get really comfortable in your chair. Think about what you need today. Are you having pain today? Are you having as if it's stressful or you're tired? Do you need some pain, some emotion? Whatever's going on, you want to talk to And then what you do is you bring that intention in front of your eyes. And cover your eyes. Don't touch your shoulders, just release your shoulders, covering your eyes. Just having a cleansing breaths, nourishing breaths. Breathing in that intention. Every time you exhale, just gently exhale everything else that is not serving you in this moment. Our jobs. Now we keep the clutch. Grind your job at night when you're stressed. Spreading your job out. Every time you move your hands when you do yourself right, you just think of that area that you put your hands on and have a complete release that muscle. It's just releasing your jaws, releasing. Work so hard all day, like talking and communicating.
this way, and this way, whatever feels comfortable to you. Think about breathing into a specific area and hear the body relax into that area. Releasing your shoulders, when we work on the heart, it has emotional release sometimes. It's really, really profound sometimes on that part. So we want to keep that idea of self, passion, self. I do know with disease and pain on a daily basis, it can be, it can be really hard on ourselves. Like, we judge ourselves, we get angry with our body, so have that compassion for yourself and for God, for others that you see that suffer and struggle. Just breathe that kindness into your heart. So you have that compassion for yourself. session we go through every chakra. And today we'll just kind of show me one. And we end your practice with just a little grace. I wish you the rest of the weekend and going forward into next week that you have a week that is grounded, where you feel balanced, where you feel creative, where you feel empowered, where you feel loved and honored and heard.
concept of working at making just some effort toward making that uh, relationship more solid uh, is good for us and perhaps will increase the wellness and the satisfaction that we get in our work our play and in our love. I'm very grateful for those of you who attempted and brought uh, to this group uh, uh, your backgrounds and shared with us. And I certainly take a great appreciation for some areas that I will look for. Uh, Stacy, uh, you want to say anything? Um, well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and thank all of you that have left. But David was really um, generous and helpful. Some very corny class teaching us about all of their practices that I think would be really helpful to the people who are here in the And I just want to remind everyone also that we do have another program coming up on November 8th, which is our normal support group tonight, which Dr. Eva Sigethi from Pittsburgh is going to be here talking about more about this kind of thing. She specializes in hypnotherapy, also that directed hypnotherapy, which is the new situation for me. And she's a really fantastic speaker. And that's a whole world for her expert, actually. <clears throat> so this will be a big presentation. And uh, we just thank you so much for coming. Please sign up. Please just sign up because we're also going to send a survey about this program.